Hit it. It's Thursday, November 26, 2020, episode 107. I'm Patrick Ceresna. And I'm Kevin Muir. This week, we welcome back to the show Andreas Steno Larson. Andreas is the chief global FX and rate strategist at Nordea. We have a great discussion about the state of European markets. And then Eric Townsend from Macro Voices joins us to talk about ABEX Technologies. In this week in trading history, we go back to the incorporation of the right company. And for the WTF clip, we do a blast from the past. And then we end with one of our segments of, well, sorry, Lena. In this week in trading history, we go back to the incorporation of the right company. And for the WTF clip, we do a blast from the past. And then we end with our segments of no stupid questions and skin in the game. And folks, we might even drink some beers along the way. So stick around. We got a great show. Lena, hop on. What uh, beer are we drinking this week? This week, we're drinking Beer Bibliotex Satsumas for the Boomers Double IPA. For the Boomers? I know. I thought about it. So I picked it. This is, again, another Swedish one. So it says here, so, it's a complex layered aroma of citrus, mainly mandarin, with tones of orange. Mm. The flavors are a blend of citrus, mandarin, grapes, and honey, ending with a balanced bitterness. A great beer to share with friends. Uh, I, I don't it. know. Oh, no, it's no, close. No, this, is good. this is good. Oh, you like it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. This is a good beer. This is, this is good. All right. Well, we'll talk about it at the end of the show. Hey, Kev, give us some disclaimers, buddy. Nothing in this podcast should be viewed as investment advice. Listeners should consult an investment pro- professional before making any decisions we're getting. Jeez. You know what? <laughs> I have to come clean with everyone. I've been fumbling my words all day. We're not going to edit this because poor Lena's already had to edit the entire front twice. So let's do this again. Nothing in this podcast should be viewed as investment advice. Listeners should consult an investment professional before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned in this show. Side effects of too much huddle may include tryptophan hangover, the Bitcoin bends, <laughs> and the EV skeevies. Oh, I, I suffer from the EV skeevies. <laughs> yeah, you and me both, buddy. You and me both. <laughs> All right. Hey, on All to right. our guests. It's our pleasure to welcome back to the show, Andreas Steno Larsen from the uh, Nordea Capital Management. Is that right? Have I got the Nordea right? Nordea Markets. I Nordea Markets. <laughs> and uh, at Nordea Markets, uh, Andreas is the Chief Global FX Rate Strategist. So, Andreas, it's a pleasure having you on again. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So, last time you were here, before we go any further, uh, it was actually the day before your wedding. Yeah. I want to I know, first of all, you're a real trooper for coming on. Everything go okay? You're still married? Yeah, she said yes, so. <laughs> despite my bad timing. so <laughs> That's right. I, although, you know what? Appearing on the market huddle the day before your wedding, I'm not sure she should have said yes. That showed some poor judgment, <laughs> but, it, but we appreciate it. And so we're looking forward to another kind of uh, update in terms of what's happening in Europe. And so let's jump into it. Yeah. Uh, you, you brought some charts. Why don't we just kind of get in here? The first one is the Pandemic Purchase Emergency Purchase Program. What are you trying to show here and why do you, what kind of story does this tell about Europe? I, I mean, if, if we look at the European Central Bank, uh, they are obviously in a situation where they need to do something to sugarcoat the new virus spread that we have in Europe. Uh, I mean, if you look across the European continent, uh, we are basically in a worse situation compared to the second quarter of this year uh, in terms of hospitalizations, in terms of fatalities, uh, and in terms of the virus spread in general. Uh, So if you look at Germany, if you look at France, um, if you look at Austria, for example, uh, basically countries are closed um, to a, a very large extent. Uh, and therefore, the European Central Bank is uh, at its toes, I, I guess. Um, and uh, if if you look at the chart here, uh, the reason why I, I brought it, um, the light blue bars, um, they, um, they show the weekly change in asset purchases from the European Central Bank. And I actually think it's quite interesting that they've slowed down the purchases compared to uh, the second quarter. Uh, and the reason is that they now um, pretty explicitly um, target just closing spreads between uh, Southern European uh, government bonds and uh, and Northern European government bonds. So they allow the market to dictate how much they buy every week. Um, and recently, Christine Lagarde said that they uh, looked into uh, increasing the duration of easing. Um, and my interpretation of that is basically that they want to implement some sort of formal yield curve control in Europe. Um, not exactly how um, they have it in Japan, but something 
fairly similar. The issue is, of course, for the European Central Bank with a lot of underlying countries and a lot of underlying yield curves that they don't have a single curve to target. Uh, so I guess some sort of spread control between, for example, Italian uh, bonds and uh, German bonds could be on the cards uh, in December when they uh, have the next meeting. Um, so, so let's just jump into that. I, I, I'm, I didn't actually realize that the ECB has kind of uh, gone off track in terms of their purchases. And, and in the past, they've, if, I, if I'm correct, they've, they've done it based upon as a percentage of the GDP of the economies. Is that correct? Yeah. And, and so now they've thrown that out the window and said, listen, you know what? The reality is that we can't do that. We're going to buy too many German boons. And the reality is that Spain and Italy need help. And that's what we're going to buy. So is, so when you look at, do they re- actually release the, the holdings of what they bought recently? Yeah, they do. I mean, they are still guided by sort of the sizes of the various economies. Right. Uh, but they, they do allow themselves a, a bit of flexibility now. Um, so if, for example, Italian spreads uh, get too wide versus Germany, then they allow themselves to, to buy more Italian debt than they sh- should otherwise have done uh, if they only looked at uh, sort of the capital ratio of each of the member states. Uh, so it is a more sort of more flexible regime compared to the old one. Um, and it's, it's quite interesting to me because then it's basically all about ensuring that no member state of the euro area pays more than other member states uh, for servicing their debt. Right. And it's interesting when you you talk about the idea that they're going to do yield curve control. And unless you do yield curve control kind of at uh, the equal amount, meaning the same rate, you're in essence deciding which countries should get charged what to be a part of the euro. euro are you not? Yeah. I mean, I guess they could, for instance, over time sort of make a promise that no member state should pay more than 50 basis points uh, of spread to German bonds uh, in, for example, the 10-year bond yield. Uh, That could be one way of implementing it. Uh, And in such case, there is, I guess, still money to be made in peripheral debt in in Europe um, because we still have wider spreads than that between, for example, Italian bonds and German bonds. Uh, So this could be when very practical way of implementing it, that basically telling markets that we don't want to spread wider than 50 basis points between any member state and Germany. Okay. Now, in the past, um, the political ramifications of doing this, of, of altering the ECB bond buying outside of this kind of GDP-based measure have kind of caused the hard money or the the German-type uh, countries to, to, to throw up their hands and say, no way. Is this just a function of COVID, meaning like, you know, in, in times of war, in times of extreme emergencies, we do what must be done? Is, is that what's happening here? Yeah, I, th- I think that's a good explanation. And I think the second explanation is that Christine Lagarde, um, the new boss of, of the European Central Bank, she's, she's basically not a typical central banker. She's a politician, in my view. Uh, and she's actually managed to sort of pave the way for this kind of change of regime. Uh, so she's much better at navigating the political scenery than uh, her um, her predecessor in, in Mario Draghi. Um, so I think that's basically one big important step for the European Central Bank that they now have a politician in, in um, uh, as the president. Right. So now one of the themes that I've been harking on is that really monetary policy is become increasingly useless in this pandemic and that really fiscal matters. Can we talk about what's happening on the fiscal side of uh, kind of in Europe and whether this ECB is basically allowing or putting the the toehold into uh, kind of a shared fiscal balance sheet in Europe? Yeah, I I mean, the usual rule uh, or the rule of thumb in in Europe is that you're not allowed to have a deficit of more than 3% of GDP. Uh, That was actually one of the rules uh, which the euro uh, was based upon uh, right. when it was implemented uh, but uh, it's basically discarded as of now um, every single member state uh, is allowed to um, to basically run with a bigger deficit than three percent of gdp uh, so from the fiscal side this is also sort of a new regime in my view and i i don't really see anything uh, happening on that front in 2021 i think everyone will be allowed to spend a lot of money uh, as long as the pandemic is, is still um, 
still not solved, you can say. So, so uh, I guess these rules are <laughs> are only paper rules, if you know what I mean. I mean, it, as soon as you get a crisis like the current, then um, you just discard them. And, and but doesn't this mean that the European um, kind of system, I guess? is becoming more entrenched and and actually making it so it's going to be more difficult for these rules to go back in terms of like, if you go and allow these countries like Europe, Italy and Spain to run these big deficits, it's going to be more difficult for them to go and for Germany to say, listen, you actually have to only do 3% because the reality is that they're going to, Germany is going to like have be more entrenched through the both physical, fiscal and monetary union with Italy. We're in essence, hugging each other closer and making it so that if we ever did want to break up it would be even more difficult yeah i mean i guess <laughs> compliance going forward would, would be very very bad um, and it will be very very tricky from a political standpoint to tell italy to uh, comply with the rules uh, since basically every single member state um uh, decided not to comply with the rules this year, for example. Um, right. So, uh, I mean, I guess you could just keep playing the crisis card if you're a Italian politician in <laughs> this kind of environment, right? <laughs> and, and so what do you think the investment ramifications are of this uh, change post-COVID? I think it's short-term pretty bullish uh, for, for European debt and for, for the euro. Um, so if, if you look at uh, the issue for the euro, if you go a couple of years back, uh, it was clear that um, the Italians needed some kind of fiscal response to the lack of growth. They've actually been allowed to do that now, uh, and they will be allowed to do that over the coming couple of years. Uh, so to me, it's, it's a pretty decent signal, at least for the short to medium term. I'm not sure that this will end well, but that's a whole different discussion. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So do you think that if we do finally get the fiscal that we need, that Europe might even eventually get themselves out of this quagmire of negative rates? Oh, that's a really good question, whether it's possible at all. I, I, I actually have um, a quote from just this week I want to mention in, in this regard, because um, one of the members of the European Central Bank was asked whether uh, they could uh, cut the deposit rate in, in Europe further. Right. Uh, for instance, if the euro uh, got too strong versus the dollar, which is kind of what we're seeing right now, right? Right. Um, and then I'm, I'm reading out aloud here. He said, it is an instrument that is still there. Um, we have very little knowledge about when the reversal weight rate would be kicking in. However, I also admit that I would rather not test that by all means, <laughs> as it could diverge from one country to another. And then the final part of the quote is, my belief is in this respect that confidence of the public in its central bank is something that we should not lose sight of. And I think that's a really interesting quote because it's basically a quote that uh, you would expect a politician to um, to say, right? Right. Uh, that, that they look into how the public perceives monetary policy. Uh, and the public is certainly not in favor of, of uh, even deeper negative rates. So I, I think for now they, they – basically don't want to go even deeper into uh, negative territory. Uh, so it, it basically leaves a skewed outcome space to the upside for, for the deposit rate, for the policy rate, I think. For those who don't know, why don't you explain what the reversal rate is that he mentioned on the, in that quote? Uh, well, I, I guess the simple explanation is basically if you go below the reversal rate, then it becomes counterproductive to, uh, to cut interest rates further. Right. Uh, and, and, I mean, I, I, would I would argue I, that they've already hit the reverse. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I was just about to say the same. <laughs> I mean, you, you have very, very clear evidence from, for example, Germany, then that uh, when you cut interest rates further, you just increase saving rates among households. Right. Uh, so basically the exact opposite of what you want. Um, and I guess the simple saver just looks at the negative interest rates uh, and then uh, concludes that oh, okay, I need to save more to have the same amount of money in a year from now. Yeah. Um, so th then it becomes counterproductive, right? It, it, it's shocking to me that central bankers, government officials, uh, economic uh, kind of uh, ivory tower people don't realize that that's what happens in the real world. That yeah. you you hit this point and you're actually not only are you not allowing the saver to save, you're actively taking away from the saver by making rates negative. Yeah. So, so, so counterproductive to what you might actually think the saver ends up saving more. Yeah. <laughs> and I think the only channel uh, which negative rates 
work through is basically uh, the uh, exchange rate mechanism. Right. Uh, so of course, if if you want to completely kill the euro, then you could uh, cut interest rates further, uh, and that will of course give sort of a glimpse of uh, inflationary momentum. Uh, but I think central bankers are too focused on inflation, but it's also, of course, the mandate that we've given them. Um, So if you only focus on getting the damn inflation to 2%, then I guess you could end up concluding that it's smart to to cut interest rates deep into negative territory, even though all other signals uh, basically, they are basically screaming uh, against that decision. Well, the the next chart that you brought is actually of the exchange rate. So why don't we kind of push on to that and talk about that? Because... um, because I, I look at the, the recent strength in the euro and I'm like, it's not that big a deal. I actually think that they should stop focusing on that, not worrying about trying to get that down and, and worry more about trying to get their economy going. And, and I'm not as fussed about the, the euro strength. What do you feel? Uh, I mean, there uh, there is definitely uh, too much of a focus within the European Central Bank on euro versus dollar. Um for some reasons, they're, they're probably just simple people, and they look at euro dollar, and one twenty ish looks a bit high, right? right. Uh, but if you look at the um, uh, trade weighted uh, euro exchange rate, then it's not that bad because we've had a, a quite big rally in emerging markets recently, right? So uh, for some reason, they just look at this one twenty uh, level and they keep staring at it uh, because every time we're close to it. Then we get someone from the European Central Bank on the wires saying that uh, now we need to focus on the exchange rate, blah, blah, blah. Um, so I, I'm not sure when they are willing to, to uh, allow 120 to breach, but, but they will be tested uh, during the first quarter next year, I think. Right. So you brought this chart, which is an analog of the 2017 price action. And it looks very similar to what we're experiencing now in 2020. Yeah. I mean, if we look back to August, September 2017, then we had euro dollar testing 120 um, a couple of times before uh, one of the members uh, of the ECB intervened rhetorically over several days against it. Um, he basically said, you shall not pass 120, uh, referring to Gandalf, right? But uh, <laughs> it, it, it's kind of the same that we see right now. Um, the, the new chief economist of, uh, of the European Central Bank, Philip Lane from Ireland, he's, he's on the wires every single time we're close to 120, um, referring to the euro dollar exchange rate. Uh, so I guess they've sort of managed to dampen ex- expectations of euro strength again here uh, because every time we get close now that it's it's kind of like the market um, knows that ECB will will uh, will hit the wires if they don't uh, sell the euro dollar pair themselves in, 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 in the market space um, so so let's see for how long we can um, we can live with this situation I mean it, it to me it's, it's a pretty clear consensus among uh, European institutional investors that the 120 will hold, right. uh, and I'm, I, I always get a little bit scared when oh. everyone agrees on something like that because then it's a really um, a scary level if we if we actually breach it, right? Yeah. Um, because everyone just sells the top side in option space and uh, and cross their fingers and hope that uh, it will go lower again when we get close to the 120 level. Eventually, just jawboning the market doesn't work. There's, no. that you need to do more as a central banker and the market will test you. Yeah. And and I think they, if they don't want to go deeper into negative territory, then um, they don't have uh, sort of the strongest tool in their toolbox uh, available right. uh, in terms of, of uh, dampening the euro momentum. Uh, so it is tricky for them to find a good solution to, to work against the euro uh, strength if, if it's going to continue. So why, why are they going um, – even thinking about going deeper into your in negative territory as opposed to expanding their QE and maybe into other risk assets eventually? I mean, if, if you look at uh, the options in the QE program, if they're, for, for example, they start buying more co- corporate debt or if they start buying more uh, Italian bonds or Spanish bonds, whatever, then I actually think that the market could perceive that as a positive euro signal. Uh, right. So so that's kind of the tricky thing for them. If, if they close spreads within the euro area, uh, they also tell markets to buy the euro. Um, we actually have a pretty strong correlation between the spread between Italy and Germany and then the euro strength. Uh, ah. The tighter the spread, the better the euro. Interesting. So yeah. it's almost like as, as they um, 
as they embrace one another and as it becomes clear that Europe's here for to stay, uh, assets yeah. are attracted to Europe and the, the you know money flows into that area. Yeah. Um, that's kind. That's kind of how it works, I guess. Uh, yeah. That um, if if the tail risk of southern European economies leaving the euro, etc., is removed, then uh, it's also a good story for the euro. Well, you know, I was looking at a, a, a kind of a table the other day of various stock markets, and I and I was going through and I was looking at the month to date uh, returns. And I was actually just flabbergasted to find that the European, the Euro stocks was at the top of my list. So let's talk a yeah. little bit about the stock market. What do you think's happening there? And what's your, what, what, what do you think's going to happen in the future? I mean, I, I don't think we've seen that big a rally in, um, in parts of Europe, uh, but uh, we've seen a really strong rally in Germany recently. Um, and core markets in, in Europe have performed really well. Um, and I think the reason is um, the same as, as uh, for the euro strength, that uh, when you have a more uniform European Union and you have a European Union that finally allows uh, for uh, fiscal stimulus, then uh, it's a game changer compared to the um, outlook that we had just a year ago. So for some weird reason you could almost say that the corona crisis has been sort of a blessing in disguise for the uh, european union since they've actually managed to um, to increase the uniformity of the union so speaking of equities i i have this theory that if you go talk to a european manager like an uh, uh, a global manager that they have to be overweight us assets and especially us equities because for the past decade the U- U.S. has been the only place that you've actually outperformed. It's uh, You've had the tailwind of both a stronger U.S. dollar and also the best stock market. And I'm thinking about it, and I'm just thinking that if you weren't overweight U.S. equities, you probably didn't have a job anymore, or at the very <laughs> least. If you were overweight European equities, you are definitely no longer working. So uh, I, people ask me, why can you be bullish on euro or the, or the European uh, equities? And I always kind of push back and say, all we need is a return to benchmark weightings and you'll actually find a lot of money flowing into these assets these european assets can you talk to me are you experiencing the same thing do you find your long-term clients positioned the way that i think that they are absolutely Uh, i i perfectly agree with that positioning uh we've tried to convey the message that uh at some point during this year europe will uh, sort of return uh, to fashion uh, just because of a uh, return to benchmark weights. Uh, and the first couple of times we toured clients with that view, um, we had a lot of pushback on the story. Um, after a couple of times, we didn't even get any invitations for anyone <laughs> <laughs> because it was obviously the wrong view for, 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 for some time. Right. Uh, but I'm actually starting to convince myself that the story is slowly but surely filtering through now um, because It is clear if you look at positioning data, uh, for example, in the northern part of Europe, that um, uh, institutions, they are massively overweight in in U.S. assets. Uh, And they've been that for quite a while. And and so if when the we all we need to them is for them just to go back to their benchmark and we could very well see this with the covid and the Lagarde. Um, I, I have a question for you in terms of Lagarde. Yeah, let's yeah. let's kind of jump into what she's doing and, and uh, uh, kind of how she's affecting these changes. At the time when she first came in, a lot of people highlighted what you talked about in terms of her being a politician, her being able to kind of institute these changes that previously that more academic heads of central banks um, were unable to do. Do you think that the COVID has actually made it her job easier? Yes, uh, I think it's a blessing for her <laughs> in, in the sense that uh, um, it, it basically allowed uh, the discussion to um, become much more concrete uh, on getting a fiscal, uh, the fiscal side of the European Union to work. Uh, because obviously we've had a need for fiscal transfers between the northern part and the southern part of Europe for a long while, but um, it took a crisis to get that change. Um, right. And I think it was uh, the old head of the uh, European Commission, uh, so um, 
the, the head of uh, the European Union Commission, he said that um, we know that the Eurozone is not perfect as it is right now. He said that in 2000, I think. Uh, but we, it will take a massive crisis for us to implement the political instruments that we need. Right. Um, and it was basically the best forecast I've uh, <laughs> ever seen because it took a, a pandemic to, um, to get politicians around the table and to get them to agree that the fiscal transfers were needed. Uh, I mean, you cannot have a currency union without fiscal transfers from the richer parts to the um, less wealthy parts. I mean, it's just a prerequisite in my view. And so one of the things that I worry about, Andreas, when I'm thinking about how this works is that let's say well, we get a vaccine, everything goes back to normal. Uh, let's conservatively say next fall. Um, by next winter, are we back to Germany screaming that the balance of the budgets need to be balanced? And uh, are we back to the same old problems? Or do you really think that uh, that it's going to be a function of it's all, at that point, there'll be enough in the pipe and, the, you know, pike and then it will keep going and that the economy will become self uh, kind of sustaining as a recovery? I, I actually think that it's important whether we actually get a success or not out of this big fiscal uh, experiment. Because if we get a year of, of massive growth next year, then I would argue that it should increase the appetite in ah. Germany for just prolonging the um, fiscal spending. Uh, so I guess the million dollar question here is whether we actually get a growth success next year. And my bet is yes. Oh, that's a great way of putting it. So you would argue that as long as this fiscal push works, the yes. public will have more appetite for it. Yes. Uh, oh, that's a great way of putting it. And it all, yeah. and then it definitely becomes self-sustaining because you get more of it. Yeah. Oh, that's that's terrific. I, I actually – I think that's the, the great idea. So in terms of trading it, let's go through. You talked about owning some uh, kind of – peripheral bonds is there anything else and, and you know you like the euro you like european stocks is there anything specifically like you like are there certain countries you like better what are your kind of uh, best ideas out there in terms of how to take advantage of this coming change if if you buy my theory that the european central bank will um, implement some sort of formal cap on spreads between peripheral bonds and and German bonds, right. then you should obviously look for the bonds with the biggest spread. Um, and uh, I guess it's the usual suspects in, in that sense, so Italy, Spain, uh, etc. Um, but in terms of equity markets, um, I would actually argue that the exact same countries should also sort of feel the tailwind from a vaccine the most. Uh, so uh, in particular, Italy and France uh, have had to close down the economy in a very draconian way. Uh, so once we actually allow uh, a reopening momentum to filter through um, asset pricing, then I would argue that those are the countries to look for uh, in terms of being bullish. Okay, Andreas, so far we've talked mostly about Europe. Let's go and, uh, you know, you're not just a European analyst, you're also a macro analyst that looks at the whole world. Let's talk about the states. Recently we had Steve Mnuchin come in and it seems to be he's done one of those uh, burn the bridges as you're leaving uh, moves with this uh, kind of taking back the money from the Fed and, the, and from Powell. What is your interpretation of what he's doing and why? Uh, I actually think it's good news what he did. Oh, really? <laughs> um, okay, and, and, and let me tell you why. <laughs> yeah, because, I mean, obviously, um, he's he's trying to annoy the new administration <laughs> by vetoing against everything. Right. Uh, so he's acting like a child, right? But um, in in any way, uh, the interesting thing is that if the Fed wants to annoy Steve Mnuchin now, <laughs> then they spent the whole wallet um, in these programs before year end. They could actually decide. To, uh, to increase, for example, corporate credit purchases uh, as a response to nuching ending the program by year end. Uh, and I, I, I mean, I, I like I know it. this is, I've, I've never I, I know this kind that. of a tip, <laughs> I know this is a tinfoil hat theory, but yeah. uh, I, if I uh, were a member of the Federal Reserve, then I would try to annoy Mutin back by just using <laughs> <laughs> the programs until the end. Right. And that's true. Actually, I've never thought about that because the, the, they've actually been underutilized and it was mostly because of the Fed put. But you could argue if you're going to take it away, you might as well spend the put. Yes. Why not? I mean, uh, and then secondly, um, I would also argue that uh, if 
the Fed wants to send the signal to Steve Nugent, then they just increase the QE pace in December, even yeah. if they don't want to. Uh, so I, I think that's basically why markets uh, almost celebrated the news <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, for some weird reason, because it, it makes it a whole lot more uh, likely that the Fed will, will turn very dovish in December. To, to so I, I 100% agree with you there that if I was sitting there on the Fed and the targeted programs that I needed to kind of pinpoint problems of the economy were taken away, it would lead me saying, well, I guess I got to do more of a blanket kind of stimulus across the board. And yeah. I, so I so I agree. Again, another reason why the euro euro currency might go up because I think the U.S. dollar is headed down. What do you think about the U.S. dollar? Yeah, I think it's it's headed down broadly speaking, um, and basically against most peers. Um, I think when we get sort of a uniform upswing next year, uh, and I think that's very likely due to the vaccine news, uh, then we basically. Um, get a focus on the double deficit in the U.S. again. The double deficit is never spoken about when there's a crisis, but it's always spoken about when uh, the rest of the world rebounds compared to the U.S. Okay. Uh, that's a, exactly the kind of scenario that we're staring into in, in 2021, in my view. Yeah, no, I could completely see that. One of the other things, though, if we did get that sort of worry that might happen is we could get a kind of a yield curve steepening. And I think one of the things that your themes that you've been talking about is a global yield curve steepening. Why don't you walk us through what you're thinking there and how it might play out? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, if, if you look at it uh, in a historical perspective, uh, let's say over the past 10 years, uh, we've actually seen the sort of the biggest landslides in uh, long bond yields. They've always occurred outside of QE programs. Uh, so recall the tapering process that was a landslide in uh, in in long bond yields when the tapering actually happened. Yeah. Uh, re recall um, the end of QE2. Yeah. Uh, when the end of QE2 occurred, then we had a massive landslide in, in long bond yields. Right. And every time... Um, Federal Reserve or the European Central Bank actually stepped up the purchases, then we had a reaction in the positive direction in long bond yields. Right, which is contrary uh, so to what almost everyone believes. But you're in a uh, esteemed company. Uh, it's not just me that believes that, but the, actually Stanley Druckermiller, who, who yeah. he, he's been arguing that for a long time, that QE purchases are actually long bond negative. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, I think the reason is that uh, QE isn't sort of artificial activity booster. Um, and it also boosts expectations. Right. Uh, so if you look at inflation expectations, they, they're actually boosted by large liquidity uh, increases. Uh, so I guess that's kind of how it works. Uh, and if we assume that the Federal Reserve um, in accident operation twist in December. I think that's likely, given how they, they even referred to Bank of Canada in the uh, meeting minutes this week. Um, Bank okay. of Canada recently did this twist, right? Uh, I guess you're right. on top of that, yep. Kevin. But, <laughs> um, I, I think there's a big sort of difference to the first twist operation back in 2011-12. Uh, the, the curve actually flattened back then. Right. But compared, compared to 2011, um, we have a much better sort of cyclical macro back backdrop now. Um, we have momentum in PMIs. We didn't have that in 2011-2012. Um, and then secondly, the Fed intends to buy bonds while they twist. Uh, they didn't do that in, in, uh, in the first twist operation. They kept uh, the bond holdings stable at that point. Right. So they and were selling they were selling short dated instruments and buying longer dated instruments. Yeah. And now they will basically just buy more longer dated right. instruments than what they already planned upon doing. Um, so I think that's an activity boost as well. Uh, so um, if we get sort of a small reflattening here in uh, into the uh, late part of the year due to COVID restrictions, etc. Then I should, uh, I would recommend to to use that to um, to bet on a, a pretty remote curve steepening in the dollar curve next year. Well, that's a great idea. Now, uh, one of the things that you mentioned is you think that the QE is actually going to go up, um, and is that also just a function of back to Mnuchin's comments, or is it also tied into the COVID issues, or is it just all of the above? Yeah, I mean, since the just since the November meeting, we've had. A clear momentum in the direction of, of more restrictions in the U.S. Um, right. it, it took kind of a while in this wave to get uh, restrictions back in place, but they they will surely be uh, be increased and not decreased ahead of the December meeting, in in, in my view. Uh, so that speaks uh, 
um, in favor of more QE. Uh, but I think the most important reason why they will do more QE is that they want to annoy Steve Nugent. <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of any better reason. Okay, so one of the other themes that's happened over the last uh, week or so is being a huge sector rotation. You know, we've we've seen some of these uh, big kind of stay-at-home stocks get crushed and a huge rush into the old value place or the old economy place, the, the reopening place, if you might. And now some people will argue that this was the, them are getting ahead of the vaccine announcement. Others will say that the other, you know, that the, the other stocks were way overpriced and this was just due. I was wondering where you fall and do you think that this rotation continues in the coming months and years? I mean, if I'm right that we will get a sort of significant steepening of the dollar yield curve next year, uh, then I guess the simple conclusion is to, I guess, sell Jeff Bezos and buy Jamie Dimon, right? Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, because, uh, I mean, tech stocks are obviously um, sort of hinging on the low for long narrative. Right. Uh, while we have several uh, value stocks that could thrive in this kind of environment. Um it's it's been a tricky call to tell people to buy banks, um, but I'm actually starting to convince myself that it could make a bit of sense next year. Yeah. Um, it, when you're telling people to buy banks, is that also include the European banks? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think that's the same story, but it's not as strong a narrative in, in Europe. Um, Why is that? Due to the due to the spread control that I um, mentioned oh, I on the, the European Central Bank, I mean, they, they will not allow the curve to steepen as much as the Fed. Uh, right. I think that's fairly certain. So yeah. so a lot of this rotation play you are viewing is a, a mainly a, a kind of a function of the steepening in the yield curve that you foresee. Yeah. Uh, and sort of these this positive cyclical macro backdrop, uh, I think we will have massive growth next year. Um I, we have a Danish word called a ketchup effect. I don't know whether you uh, you have that word. Ketchup in, in effect, English. like as in yeah. like the the condiment. Yeah, I mean, if if you have a Heinz bottle, right, and yep. you're trying to get the ketchup out, once it actually gets out, you get a lot of ketchup on your plate every time. <laughs> <laughs> and and I think we will have that sort of effect in the economy next year. I mean, everyone's so tired of staying at home that as soon as you're allowed, uh, then I mean, then we will have consumption. Um, growing in 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 all sorts of ways um and there will be some sort of pent up demand i i I simply think people are so tired of staying at home that they will spend a lot of money when once they're allowed to go out i i hear you that's a great idea you know when you talk about ketchup we as canadians are obsessed with ketchup we have more i think we're one of the biggest consumers of ketchup in the world and (laughs) we've actually created a potato chip a ketchup yeah. potato chip. Have you ever had them? Do you have them in Denmark? Yeah, I think I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so uh, America doesn't have it. The U- U.S. does not have it. So there's like celebrities that come up to Canada and bring back boxes of these things because they like them. <laughs> okay. And so, but anyways, I like that the ketchup effect. That's awesome. <laughs> Uh, Andreas, it's been a pleasure having you on. Why don't you tell people where they can find more about your great research and how they can contact you if they want to talk about any of those things? Yeah, I mean, I'm on I'm on Twitter, uh, uh-huh. and uh, for some reason, the Nadia Bank allows me to um, always <laughs> say whatever I want in there. So <laughs> that's that's one good way of, of uh, following my uh, my thoughts. Uh, but secondly, we also have at least parts of our research um, free of charge online at corporate.nadia.com. That's terrific. Well, it's, it, I highly recommend you follow both Andreas on Twitter and also go check out his research. It's some of the greatest stuff out there. And as he says, a lot of it is free and it's terrific stuff. Thank you so much for being on our show again. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. Well, it's our great pleasure to welcome to the show the one and the only Eric Townsend. Eric, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me on, guys. So it's been a little awkward. Uh, You know, (laughs) Patrick cheats on me on a regular basis on your show. And now the three of us. Whoa, 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 whoa. Patrick was my boy before he was your boy. (laughs) He's cheating on me, not cheating on you. That, that, oh, that is gosh. true, Kev. Sorry, buddy. No. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it is awkward. Well, hopefully we'll make it through it. It's, uh, it's the awkward threesome, but we're, we'll have some fun. Oh, that's a, that's a visual that's worse than yeah, the that stuff that you publish in here. <laughs> <laughs> so, Eric, we got to talk Bitcoin. It's on everyone's mind. And 
the fact is that Bitcoin's rocketing to the moon. At the same time, gold's you know hitting new lows. What's your thinking here? Well, it's not new lows. Gold well, new is, lows is, for the recent, uh, by I guess in the last three four months. Yeah, no, I think that the two are very strongly related. I think that what's going on here is gold is being perceived by part of the market. It's basically your father's Oldsmobile. Everybody's figured out that the Fed is going to continue to debase fiat currency and that it's time to move into your fiat debasement hedge instrument in size. And what's going on, I think, is that Bitcoin is the one that's trending. And a lot of people who were on the fence, who weren't sure, whatever, were, are kind of looking at it saying, hmm, uh, I don't know, I'm really smart enough to understand what the real differences are, but I can see one is trending up strong and the other one's just kind of just lying there. And if you look at the flows, you're seeing a lot of fund flows out of gold funds and into Bitcoin funds. So I think what's going on is this is about the Bitcoin rally, pulling a lot of uh, marginal gold buyers out of the market because they're buying Bitcoin instead. And it's also causing redemptions on the gold side and pushing people into Bitcoin. And I do not think that's because fundamentally the Bitcoin argument makes more sense. I think most of the people in this trade haven't really thought it through completely because this is supposed to be about a flight to safety into hard assets. Gold is a hard asset. Um, Bitcoin is inherently, a, it's, it's, it, you know, it's not a hard anything. It's a virtual <laughs> thing. It exists only in cyberspace. And it is a very clever scarcity asset. It, it is, um, you know, using technology, it creates a scarcity element, but it's not a hard asset. It's not a physical thing. And it's also not something that serves a, a useful purpose that you could rely on if you weren't using it for money. So I don't think it, it makes fundamental you know, investment sense, but I think it's going to continue because we're on the verge of a breakout to a new all time, or maybe we're already there. I haven't been paying attention in the last uh, few days. Uh, if Bitcoin hasn't yet broken out to new highs past what it was a couple of years ago, it's about to. And when it does, that will probably beget more buying. And I think that that ultimately begets more weakness in gold. And frankly, as a gold investor, I'm really looking forward to that because I think that Bitcoin is an even more emotional market than gold is. It's going to overshoot to the upside just like it did last time. Eventually, it's going to have another blow off top. That big rally, if the rally is still ahead of us, is probably going to take more wind out of the sails of the gold market. And I will be loving the opportunity to buy that correction in gold so that when you eventually see the blow off top in Bitcoin and Bitcoin is coming down and people are, oh, my God, panicking, they're going to be rushing back into gold. And I think you see the, you know, think of it like a seesaw, like we're going to have a big leg up in Bitcoin while gold is taking a breather. Then we're going to have a big leg up in gold while Bitcoin is taking a breather. Um, if you if you think that's what's happening, and I'm very quickly coming around to the view that that is the primary driver of what's happening in these markets, at some point when you see signs of the blow off top in Bitcoin, and we're not there yet by any stretch, but when we get to that, uh, that should be a bottoming point and, and a, a leverage opportunity to really lever up on gold for the next leg higher as Bitcoin starts to correct back down. So I, I can't say with certainty that that's what's going to happen, but that's my current thinking. So, Eric, you're going to get us in all sorts of trouble there. You said all sorts of things that the Bitcoin bulls are going to have trouble with. But listen, we are no coiners, Patrick and I, so you're going to be well suited into our group here. <laughs> oh, they're going to – I'm going to get hate. I know. You will get the hatred. So they are. But I, I always tell them, Eric, I joke with them, and I say, you don't want us buying it because by the time we buy it, that will be the sure sign of the top. So you should actually be happy that we are refusing to kind of jump on the bandwagon. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm good with that. But I, I, I say watch the top. Watch for signs of a reversal in Bitcoin. And I don't think we're there yet. I think it's, it's months off. Oh, you um, think it's months when, off. So do you think that gold – let's just talk briefly about gold. And uh, it's it, it's really been struggling recently. And uh, I'm wondering what sort of levels you're thinking it might get down to if you're thinking that the Bitcoin rally is going to get all the more violent. 
if Bitcoin really takes off and there's a big, you know, everybody is saying, oh, you know, gold is is a antiquated relic. Bitcoin is where it's at. Uh, everybody dive into to Bitcoin. I think that could really cause gold to take a nosedive. I doubt at this point we're going to get back to the 1377 would be the, the major technical support level at this point. Uh, I don't think we'll get all the way down there, but I wouldn't be surprised to see 1500 if you see a really big uh, Bitcoin rally. All right. All right, guys. Listen, Eric, I want to get on to uh, another story here because what we brought you on to talk about here. So what's the story here with Abex Technologies, the company that's sponsoring that new Smarter Markets podcast? Who are the founders of the startup and how did you uh, get involved as an angel investor? Well, this is Josh Crumb's venture. And uh, Josh is an ex Goldman Sachs commodities guy turned fintech entrepreneur. But he's he's a good ex-Goldman guy. He's not the usual Harvard MBA Goldman idiot. He's a Colorado School of Mines grad, Canadian, good guy. Uh, best known as the founder of Gold Money, which is the outfit that kind of lets you have a, a bank account denominated in gold. So you put your money in and you're basically buying physical gold. So it's backed by physical gold, but you get a, an ATM card and a debit card. You can, you know, go to buy a pint of beer and, and pay for it from your gold money credit card. And it, you know, gets converted into gold and charged to your account and so forth. So they did the combination of physical gold storage integrated with the modern financial system so that you can spend it with debit cards and so forth. The other founders of Abex are veterans of the futures exchange business, not so much the trading side, but the actual exchange side, the guys who designed Clearport for NYMEX. Tom McMahon is probably the, the main founder from that side of the house. Um, and as far as how it came about, Josh emailed me one day uh, looking for introductions, basically. And the email basically said, listen, Eric, I, I want to, you know, would you take a phone call? Because we're doing a capital raise for this startup that I'm doing, and we have just 500000 left to fill. And I'm thinking, you know, you, you know a lot of accredited investors because of the Macro Voices podcast. If you knew 10 guys that could come in at 50 k each, you know, we'd get our five hundred grand and we could launch our thing. So my first reaction, because I get emails like this all the time, was, F you, I'm not introducing you to anybody. Uh, I'm not your cap intro broker, you know, piss off. But it was Josh Crumb. So I decided to take the call, mostly out of curiosity, just to find out what the hell he was doing. By the time, to make the long story short, by the time the call was over, my answer had changed to, F you, I'm not introducing you to anybody because I want the whole 500000 myself. And that was the, the, the first interaction with them. So it was on the first call that I made that commitment. After we did the first round of get to know you and due diligence and learning more about it and finding out who the other angel investors were primarily, when I found out Kyle Bass is an angel investor in this thing, Robert Friedland, the Canadian billionaire financier and mining you know, tycoon, is one of the angels behind this. Uh, the other seed investors are all big names like that. Uh, I ended up doubling on my original investment, which took some negotiating because they didn't they didn't want that much in their launch originally. So this was all I don't know several months ago, probably six months ago. Um, they were very secretive about their plans uh, before they're launched, like any startup. You know, they don't want to talk until they're ready to do their thing. Their stock is going to start trading publicly in the middle of December. They're targeting December 15th as the first trading date. So now they're doing a publicity campaign, which includes sponsoring a new podcast, which Macro Voices is going to produce for them, called Smarter Markets that I'm going to be hosting. Uh, and they're also kind of, you know, showing themselves to the public. So I'm finally allowed to talk about this, which I'm, as you can tell, pretty excited about. So Eric, uh, on your Macro Voices podcast, you mentioned that these guys were going to supposedly make the market smarter, quote unquote. Uh, you know, I've heard this so many times before. That could mean almost anything. What do they actually do? Like, who are their customers? How are they going to make money? What is the kind of secret sauce to their new product? Well, that's a simple question and a good one, but the answer is complicated because it comes in different time frames. 
I'm focused on a longer time horizon than what they're actually selling right now. So the analogy that comes to my mind, I don't know if you guys know the name Tony Fidel, famous Silicon Valley design engineer, known as the father of the iPod and one of the principal designers of the iPhone. So around 2010, Tony decides to leave Apple and go do his own startup. You know, this is the guy that invented the iPhone. So everybody in Silicon Valley is like, okay, what is the new device? What is the the new thing that Tony is coming up with? How's he going to outdo the iPhone? And eventually they have their big press release and announce what the company is going to do. And da-da-da-da, drum roll please, what is it? A thermostat. And Everybody is like, okay, Tony has flipped his lid. The guy has totally lost it. A thermostat, like the guy who invented the iPhone, are you crazy? What's going on? Well, what really was happening was Tony Fidel is absolutely brilliant. He correctly anticipated that the Internet of Things was going to be a major trend. So the thermostat was just the first product to launch the company. And of course, the company was Nest. They ended up selling that company in an acquisition for 3.2 with a B billion dollars just two or three years later. So needless to say, he knew exactly what he was doing. But at the moment of that introduction, everybody was like, thermostat? Are you kidding? Why am I telling you that story that obviously has nothing directly to do with Avix? technologies. Well, the reason is I think they're basically having their thermostat moment right now with what they're doing. What they're announcing is a new commodity futures exchange that will be based in Singapore, and it will introduce a new physical delivery liquid natural gas contract. And Kevin, I know you know about uh, commodity futures. Physical delivery is really important because it ties the price discovery to the real price of things as opposed to the manipulated price of some index. And until now, there hasn't been any natural gas contract which is actually physically delivered. And it's not trivial to, to do that because natural gas, the, the storage and delivery uh, logistics are fairly complex. So they, they've got this uh, physical delivery natural gas contract, which Okay, fine. That's, you know, a really interesting innovation. If you happen to be in the physical part of the energy market and you care about that stuff, which I'm not, and I don't frankly care. Um, Although I guess it's a big deal to the people that it's a big deal to. They've also got some other innovations immediately. This thing called ID++, which is basically a technical architecture for secure trader connectivity. So, you know, traders use chat groups to talk among each other with about what trades they're doing. Those things have been hacked in the past where somebody's impersonating somebody else and recommending trades. And so they've done like a super secure version of chat rooms and and trader chat kind of tools and and basic stuff like that. Um, It's all cool. It's it's great. But I don't think there's any great earth shattering thing here. And I have to be careful because they're a sponsor now of Macro Voices, and I don't want to piss them off because they're very excited about this stuff. I think it's just the thermostat moment where they're introducing this natural gas. I guess there's going to be a gold contract too. To me, it's all a thermostat. I'm focused on the long-term strategy, which I think their ultimate mission is going to be much broader, much more ambitious, and much more exciting. So the reason that I invested is not because they're going to do a new futures exchange in Singapore, which should be trading by early 2021. It's because of the plans that they have after that that really got me excited about this. All right. Well, you've got me interested now. So you, you're talking here about this long term. So what is this long term mission you're talking about and what, that's got you all excited? Well, first, I need to be careful here because what I've told you about what I'm calling the thermostat story is really their whole story in terms of what they're staying, saying publicly and they're sticking to it. So the rest of what I have to say is me talking. I'm speculating. These are my own thoughts. I don't represent the company. I'm telling you why I invested and what I see on the horizon. Um, you know, and to be sure, too, Nest needed their thermostat. They needed to have a product that was going to generate some revenue to pay the bills until they did more interesting, cooler things. And so does Abex. So the, the natural gas contract, the beginning of futures trading, the stuff that they're doing is all strategic and it all fits into a plan. But as far as what's their Internet of Things vision, 
Uh, it's going to be pioneering the adoption of secure digital bearer instruments as the basis for an entirely new generation of financial markets, starting with re-engineering how commodity futures markets work. And I want to emphasize, I'm talking about re-engineering, not just the market in order to you know use some cool technology, but re-engineering the functionality of the market. What we have really today are financial markets that were designed as paper systems, you know, uh, guys with a chalkboard writing stock prices and people screaming out bids and offers and so forth, uh, and, and people, you know, writing their, their number down on a, on a little notepad someplace. What we've done with financial markets in the last 40 or 50 years is we've computerized those old manual paper systems and we've automated them, but they're the same old tech systems that they used to be. We haven't really thought about how to use technology to re-engineer the functionality of the market and make it do new things that it didn't used to do. And what I see ABEX is doing is pioneering the adoption of distributed ledger technology, particularly, and secure digital bearer instruments in order to completely change the way markets work. Now, there's only one part of that that they're actually publicly talking about, which is replacing the warehouse receipts and the physical delivery of commodity futures with Ethereum smart contracts based on secure digital bearer instruments, thereby allowing true ownership of physical commodities in the form of a fungible digital bearer instrument that can be transmitted electronically. And that is revolutionary unto itself. It doesn't end there though. That's just the part they're talking publicly about. I'm convinced they have plans that are much broader and in much longer term that they're not talking about publicly yet. So Eric, one second, we got to step back here because you've thrown out a lot of different terms. And for a guy that was kind of crapping all over Bitcoin, it sure sounds like you've embraced the digital, uh, you know, with these Ethereum smart contracts. What does all this, though, have to do with commodity futures and warehouse receipts? Okay, the important innovation, and it was a, a, a just, and this is my frustration with this whole crypto thing. When the, the guys who invented Bitcoin under the, the pseudonymous name of Satoshi Yakamoto, the, the breakthrough in computer science and the breakthrough in financial innovation was the invention of the secure digital bearer instrument, the idea of double spend proof digital cash, that you can actually have the equivalent of cash in a computer system and it can't be copied and double spent and it, it truly has the characteristics of cash. That secure digital bearer instrument was just a profound invention. Now, the first application of that invention was to creating these alternative currency systems, cryptocurrencies, which are basically designed to piss governments off. And they're in a contest to see how long they can keep pissing governments off until governments actually do something about it. And I, it's gone on a lot longer than I expected. So, you know, we'll see. Maybe it'll keep going on. If you remember back to the beginning of this whole crypto evolution around 2012, 2013, a lot of people in finance were looking at it saying, wow, you know, this blockchain thing, not so much Bitcoin itself, but this blockchain thing is going to be revolutionary. They were kind of missing part of this, which is the way blockchain works, it's so inefficient with its proof of work validation system that you, you kind of need to have a currency in order to create an incentive for people to mine it. Because if you don't have miners, then the whole thing doesn't work. Um, as far as what, uh, where I think this is ultimately headed, the invention of secure digital bearer instruments is going to completely, totally change the entire financial industry. It's, it's going to be as big to the financial industry as, you know, the invention of the internet or the personal computer was to, to society on a whole. It's, it's a really, really big deal. Now, where does Ethereum which is a cryptocurrency and its blockchain come into this. Ethereum's blockchain can be used to tokenize other assets. So if you want to take a warehouse receipt in the, in the design of, in, and I guess we should explain how warehouse receipts work. When you buy commodity futures, if you stand for delivery, which is you're not just going to settle your contract in, in cash before it expires, but you're actually going to take delivery of, if it's a gold contract, it's 100 ounces of gold, or if it's an oil contract, it's 1,000 barrels of oil. 
when you close that secure that uh, futures contract, what you actually get is a warehouse receipt, which is physically exchangeable. Whoever's got it can exchange it for the hundred ounces of gold or the the thousand barrels of oil or whatever. So it's called a bearer asset. Means if you have physical possession of that piece of paper you've got the thousand barrels or you can exchange it for the thousand barrels of oil. So if you lose it, <laughs> you're screwed and it could easily be counterfeited. There's all kinds of problems with these, this paper warehouse receipt system, but that's all they've got. Tokenizing that using Ethereum's blockchain. Now, long-term, I don't think blockchain is the right distributed ledger. That's kind of a, a, a out of scope story that I don't want to go down that rat hole right now. Someday we're going to have distributed ledgers that don't require mining or miners, and they're going to be a whole lot more efficient. For now, the best way to tokenize assets like warehouse receipts is to use Ethereum's blockchain and Ethereum smart contracts. Um, so imagine that warehouse receipt that's good for the hundred uh, ounces of gold or the thousand barrels of oil or whatever. If that's a digital token, First of all, it solves a whole bunch of counterfeiting issues. A major problem that happens with these uh, bearer instruments when you have a warehouse receipt that's good for 100 ounces of gold. Um, that's like $185,000 worth. So, you know, for one contract. So if it's, if it's 10 contracts, you know, that's, that's a lot of money. People use those as collateral and take loans against them. Well, what happens if you're pledging the same warehouse receipt as collateral on five different loans or 10 different loans? You know, they get rehypothecated. You can solve that problem by making it a digital token asset. But the really, really cool implications are that now that token becomes fungible. If, it's, if it has the value of 100 ounces of gold, then presumably it has that you know, it's exchange, it's, it's redeemable with a particular exchange. Let's say it's the COMEX in New York. But you can easily imagine how other people around the world would be willing to exchange that same token, maybe plus a, a transaction fee, for delivery of 100 ounces of gold someplace else because they can always arbitrage any, any price difference out, back out of that. So if you have fungible warehouse receipts that can be transmitted in a computer, you guys know how airlines... Uh, hedge their their fuel expenses they as they're selling tickets they're pricing the tickets based on current fuel prices and once they sell a bunch of tickets they have to go and say okay how many tickets did we sell uh that's going to end up to 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 deliver those tickets in order to fly the planes that are going to fulfill the tickets that we sold it's going to require x amount of jet fuel so we're going to go buy futures contracts for that many barrels of jet fuel in the futures market now so that we're hedging our future exposure. So if the price goes up, we'll be covered. Well, you can imagine that they could just buy jet fuel as a digital token with some AI-based, you know, machine learning high-tech system. And you could imagine, you know, airlines code, code share relationships, passing, you know, fuel credits back and forth, passing uh, airfare credits back and forth as secure digital tokens between computer systems. And then eventually, after that token gets handed around and passed around, maybe it's been owned by five different airlines as a hedging instrument by the time the, the computer systems are done trading it all. When it comes back to the exchange, it gets traded in and actually delivered against for the thousand barrels of jet fuel. You can suddenly imagine all kinds of automation applications because that warehouse receipt is not a physical piece of paper that got FedEx to somebody anymore. It's a digital uh, token in a system that, that allows it to be securely transmitted anywhere in the world instantaneously. So it just opens up all kinds of, of new possibilities. And I got a chance to talk to Tom McMahon, who's the guy at Abex doing the design of all this. And he said a surprise for them was the AML implications, the, the anti-money laundering implications, because what they realized with, was when you originally get that token, you know, if you're trading money, you have to do AML authentication on who's giving you money and, you know, who's got the token. But then the token can be traded by five or six different third parties with no AML requirement, eventually 
it comes back into the system. Just like if you take delivery of 100 ounces of gold, those gold bars can be sold back and forth to you know a whole bunch of different jewelry guys in New York City. Eventually, if they want to go back and deliver them into the futures market, they have to pay for an assay. They have to, to pay to get the, the gold verified to make sure it's really gold before it goes back into the system. In the same way, if you had a warehouse receipt for a futures contract that was a Ethereum token, there has to be AML verification to the first guy who bought it, but then it can go all around, be owned by 20 different parties, and eventually the last guy who wants to actually take the physical delivery of the 1,000 gallons of jet fuel, he has to be AML authenticated in order to meet uh, the legal requirements, but none of the other intermediaries in between need to. And if you wanted to go back, if if legally, if there was some need for an audit trail to go back and figure out who touched this thing, well, if it's a blockchain, it there's visibility to all of the transactions, what happened, where, when, whatever. It's much more transparent than any kind of historical, you know, legacy system. So there's just all kinds of applications for this, as much as in the in the early days, I, I guess to, to sort of net it down to what is this about, in the early days of crypto, there were all these guys in the finance industry running around saying, oh, blockchain technology, we're going to do all kinds of things with blockchain technology. You didn't see a whole lot actually come out of that because there weren't many people who really understood how finance systems work, how financial markets work, and who understood the distributed ledger technology that is what underpins these cryptocurrency systems. What ABEX is all about is using these technologies, uh, I hate to call it blockchain technology, but that's what a lot of people call it, using distributed ledger technology to completely re-engineer the way commodity futures markets work to allow them to do things that they never used to do before. That's the part, what I just described, that they're talking publicly about. Now, there's a whole bunch more that I speculate they intend to do because it's obvious to me that they should be. And Josh is a smart guy and his team are smart guys. So I'm sure that's where they're headed. But the, what I just described is as much as they seem to want to uh, publicly discuss at this point. All right. So Eric, like this is so cool. Like, you're, so you let's just kind of re review this. So you're, the plan is to completely replace these paper uh, warehouse certificates, which of course are all vulnerable to being counterfeited or double pledged as collateral for this kind of shady financing stuff. And it's going to be replaced with completely secure and completely fungible digital bearer instruments. And so is this the essence of the longer term future you see for ABEX beyond the supposed like a thermostat phase you were talking about for these natural natural gas contracts or this uh, trader chat tool? It's, it's just the first phase. I think there's a lot more phases after that. They're, they're talking about digital bearer instruments for warehouse receipts right now. And that's something they're willing to discuss publicly. Um, the rest of what I have to say, I just want to underscore, is my own personal uh, speculation. But the analogy here, I think, is Jeff Bezos in 1998 said he was in the book business. He was going to sell books on the internet. And at the time, a lot of people looked at that and said, okay, well, how big is the book business? I mean, how even if it someday got so big that it was as big as Barnes & Noble, you know, how big is the book business, really? What they didn't realize is that Jeff Bezos was a man with a plan. He only chose books as the first thing to sell on the internet because it was a, a small thing that was easily, you know, shipped and it, it, it made sense. Um, the first epiphany that I had with respect to Abex and what they're doing was when I started thinking this through and I said, well, wait a minute. Um, you know, one of my, one of my original concerns was, was, okay, they're running this like Singapore based commodity exchange. It's only going to trade a couple of contracts at first. And I was thinking, well, first of all, you know, that's kind of like CME group and ice are the Coke and the Pepsi of commodity futures. So Abix sounded to me at first, like it's Stewart's root beer. Like, you know, they're going to try to compete with Coke and Pepsi. How's that ever going to work? And Singapore, why dial domiciled in Singapore? That didn't make sense to me at first. And then I started thinking about how markets evolve. Go back to, you know, Kevin, you've been in the institutional side of, of finance for decades. Go back to 
the old days when we used to achieve leverage entirely by margin borrowing. That was the only way you could get leverage for a hedge fund or any kind of, you know, hot money trading. Then what happened is at some point somebody figured out, hey, wait a minute, you know, commodity futures offer a more efficient form of leverage without the margin interest. So if we invented these stock index futures, we could give the guys that are speculating in the stock market a more efficient way of using leverage. And we could, you know, take over a bunch of market share from the stock market by bringing that kind of stock trading, stock index trading into the futures market. And of course, that was, you know, in the beginning when the, the S&P futures contract was first introduced, the idea was the S&P futures contract is designed to track the value of the actual S&P index. These days, I think the S&P index is actually, you know, the price discovery is happening in the e-mini S&P futures contract, and the index is just tracking what's happening in the futures contract. So we've basically seen a transformation of the industry to where most of the hot money trading is in futures because they trade more hours per day and they give you more efficient leverage and so forth. Well, think about a much bigger change for the industry, not just a better way to do leverage, but think about really embracing digital bearer instruments so that everything is a token. When you buy stock, you know, forget about this nonsense of what is it, T plus three, it takes three days to, for the exchange to clear your transaction as if clearing was some monumental task. Why does it take more than three milliseconds to clear a transaction on the stock market? Because the IT guys in the finance industry are the only IT guys left on the frickin' planet who still think that batch processing is a good idea. When I first got involved as a teenager in the computer industry in the late 1970s, we were making fun of batch processing then. And it's finance guys are the only people in IT that still think that's a smart way of designing things. So imagine that we're someday gonna get to a new paradigm where the way markets work is totally different Everything is digital uh, instruments, everything is tokenized, and every transaction happens instantly. There's no T plus anything. It's T plus right now. The, the, you do the transaction, it's over, it's done, you own the asset one millisecond after you, you click the buy button. Now, Kevin, think about this question. Who is in a position that they're able to lead the way, to, to, to guide the rest of the marketplace through a change like that. Go back to my analogy of how we got from leverage with margin interest to leverage with futures. Well, the answer is nobody can do that unless you own an exchange because it's the exchanges that write the contract specifications and get to introduce new products. Investment banks can introduce new derivative products on the over-the-counter market, but if you're talking about exchange-traded instruments, it's only the exchanges. So you've got to own an exchange. And furthermore, if you're talking about the kind of monumental, you know, completely change the face of the industry change that I see coming in the next 20 years, you've got to be an exchange that has a relationship with your regulators that they're willing to work with you and think outside the box and be open to doing new things. And then it all, it's like, I, I literally woke up in the middle of the night one night. I said, oh my God, Singapore is engaged right now politically in this big strategic plan to try to benefit as much as they can from what unfortunately has been the collapse of Hong Kong because of China essentially not honoring the 2047 agreement and annexing Hong Kong into China. For years and years and years, we've had Shanghai is China's financial center and Hong Kong was the gateway to the West. Singapore's government wants to take over as much of that gateway to the West as they can. If you're trying to lead this, if you want to be one of the people who's really driving this kind of change, you got to own an exchange and you got to own an exchange in a jurisdiction where the regulators are going to be ready to work with you. And when I thought of this one night in the middle of the night, 
it was just in my head. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, it makes sense. If you're in Singapore, it's a tiny little place where everybody knows everybody. The government has no exposure to the futures, uh, commodity futures business. They want it, and they're going to be willing to work outside the box creatively to create new products. That was just my theory. When I interviewed Robert Friedland for the new podcast, Robert Friedman is a billionaire, as you know, uh, you know, mining tycoon and Singapore based venture capitalist and financier who's in, he's lived in Singapore for 25 years. He's in tight with the government there. He confirmed in that podcast before I even brought it up, Singapore wants this business. And so all of a sudden it all made sense. It's like, this is why they're putting this in Singapore. This is why they're, they're launching, you know, it's a nat gas contract so that they can own an exchange, so that they're, when they're ready to introduce digital bearer instruments to replace the way most financial transactions get settled and cleared, they'll be in the driver's seat to do it, and they'll have a friendly work, reg regulator and a friendly jurisdiction to work in. So tying that all together was kind of when I said, oh boy, that was, that was when I wanted to increase my, uh, my investment the first time. So, Eric, that's a fascinating story, and I can see why you jumped all over it when you were given the opportunity. But it's not going to just be for the private uh, kind of angel investors for long, right? They have talk about taking this out and making it a publicly traded company. Why don't you walk us through how they're going to do this and what form this is going to take? Kevin, they're doing a reverse merger in order to get the stock trading publicly, very similar to a SPAC transaction where you've got an existing, uh, essentially, shell company, publicly traded entity that you reverse merge into so that you get uh, public trading capability. Now, my first assumption was, okay, when you do a SPAC or a reverse merger transaction, that gives you public trading of your stock. But unlike an IPO, it's not inherently a capital raise. So my first thought was, okay, that must mean that they're going to do a capital raise at the same time. Because normally when you do a reverse merger, the company still needs to raise money. So they, they do a secondary offering and either it's at the same time or it's immediately thereafter or something. So when I talked to them and I said, okay, how much money, because I'm thinking about, you know, how much my shares are going to get diluted by the capital raise and so forth. How much money are you going to raise in the capital raise after you get your stock trading publicly in the reverse merger? And the answer is none. And I said, what do you mean none? And Josh Crum told me, he says, I don't want the dilution. Uh, we don't need it. We can, with the capital that we've already raised, from the angels that we have, and especially with the connections that our angels have in the industry, we've got enough capital, and I don't want to take the dilution of my shares or your shares. We're, we're done. Someday we'll probably have to do a secondary offering to really grow the company to the next level. But for the foreseeable future, no capital raise. That was the second epiphany in my mind, was I said, wait a minute. Because, you know, frankly, Goldman Sachs guys always worry me a little bit. You know, <laughs> is, is this going to be... Is this going to be one of those stories where the founder's using all of his Goldman Sachs connections and cocktail parties and so forth to get as far as the IPO and maybe a little bit of a, you know, a stick around holding period on his stock and then he can cash out and move on to his next venture or whatever? When I hear that Josh doesn't want the dilution in his own shares and he's not going to do a capital raise, which would normally be the way the founder's get their exit opportunity is, you know, there's an external capital raise that's supposedly to make the company grow bigger, but it's the way the founders get the money to, to, to bail out on the, on the venture. Josh is not bailing on this. This is a man with a plan. Just like Jeff Bezos starting what was supposedly a bookstore, Josh is starting supposedly a natural gas trading uh, exchange. I think his intention is he's launching Tony Fidel's thermostat or Jeff Bezos's bookstore here. I think that Josh intends to spend the rest of his career being the guy who pioneered the adoption of secure digital bearer instruments in financial markets, just the way Jeff Bezos was the guy who brought e-commerce to the world. I predict that Josh will retire a billionaire before he's 50. And I think that this is the last thing he's going to do. It's not just, you know, serial entrepreneur stuff. I think this is his mission. And I think that he's going to see it through. 
eventually what I see this heading to is the redesign of financial markets, not just commodity futures, but all financial markets. Because the concept of a stock market, a bond market, a commodity futures market, these are all things that were invented hundreds of years ago with paper systems. And those paper systems have now been automated and computerized. But nobody has really stopped to think about redesigning the functionality of what the market itself does. So we don't have T plus three clearing. We should have T plus three milliseconds clearing. We should, we should do things instantaneously. We should get away from batch processing. Uh, when I wrote in my book about my vision of digital sovereign bond markets and why they could fundamentally have a humanitarian impact on society because they would give smaller nations different financing options than they have today. I have to admit, when I was writing that chapter of the book, I was thinking to myself, who have I ever met in finance who either gets this vision or knows how to implement it technically? Nobody. Probably never happened. Well, these guys are not ready to do this tomorrow. But Josh and his team are the first people that I've seen that have, I think, the same vision that I do, which is we need to redesign, not just enhance the, the, the way the computer systems work, but we need to design the functionality of what the market does. And frankly, we need to realign markets with the purpose for which they were originally designed for, which is to facilitate the efficient formation of capital to help society. We need to make the market better benefit society than it does, because frankly, we're facing a crisis in capitalism right now. So, uh, my vision may or may not exactly match their plan because they're not telling me their plan. It's secret that they won't tell me exactly what's on their mind. Um, they have, though, uh, commissioned me to produce the Smarter Markets podcast for them. Now, the concept of the Smarter Markets podcast is to brainstorm with some of the smartest people in the business. The first episode is Robert Friedland, mining tycoon from Canada, billionaire, incredibly smart guy. Um, the idea of smarter markets is to brainstorm and conceive ideas for how we could redesign markets to make them smarter, more efficient, and more effective at actually achieving the purposes for which they exist, which is to better society by providing efficient formation of capital to grow and expand business. We're going to start having those conversations. I am sure that I'm going to get my vision in front of his customers because I'm going to get it all over the podcast. So whether they have my vision or not, they will soon enough. And I want to be clear, too. Josh Crum has never told me any of this stuff that I'm telling you now about redesigning the entire functionality of, of financial markets or you know, having a plan to, to be the, the Jeff Bezos of doing this. I'm convinced that that is the plan that he's on. And I'll just, you know, Kevin, you've been around the, uh, you know, the industry for a long time. When is the last time that you heard of a Goldman Sachs guy being offered more money than he was asking for and turning it down <laughs> because he doesn't want to dilute the value of his own shares? It's been a long time. Well, this is when I yeah, had my ever. second epiphany. It was when I figured all this stuff out. So I called Josh up and I said, Josh, you're not doing a capital raise. This affects my decision to invest. And immediately his reaction was, oh, if you don't want to invest, it's okay. We found other guys. And I said, no, no, dude, what do you mean if I don't want to invest? I don't want to invest 500000 I I want a million. And his reaction was defensive. He said, you want another million? No way. I can't do it. Look, I'm, I'm, I'm past my dilution limit. I've got several people that are asking me to do this, and I can't. Well, first of all, I wasn't asking for another million. I only wanted to take the 500 and extend it by 500 to make 1 million total. But when he said that, and he's defensive about it, and I'm just thinking, when has a Goldman Sachs guy ever turned down money? Um, he knows that he's on to something really hot here. He doesn't want to dilute it. So I didn't actually intend to mean a million more, but I played it as if I did. And he says, no way. And I said, well, how about if I meet you in the middle at, at one and a quarter total? And, and we ended up at 1.2. So uh, I'm going to buy more when it starts trading. I, I want more of this. Um, I am convinced, and, and I should be really clear too, 
you know, ABEX might or may, might not be who does this. I am personally convinced that we're going to have a revolution in finance where the markets will be redesigned to fully embrace what some people call blockchain technology. I don't call it that. I call it secure digital bearer assets because we're going to get rid of blockchain eventually and use a distributed ledger that doesn't require mining in order to make it much more efficient. But we're going to embrace the best technology to redesign the markets and make it better. Is it a sure thing that ABEX is going to be at the center of that? Absolutely not. It's a speculation. Uh, frankly, Josh and his team are the first company I've encountered that gets it and has impressed me that they get it and they have a vision that's very compatible with my own. Um, they're going to be the first entrant in this space. Eventually, it's going to be a space race. This will be huge. Probably what happens is eventually ABEX gets, you know, acquired by somebody much better healed that's, you know, ready to spend billions doing this. Or maybe they'll see it through to the end like like uh, Bezos did and be the only ones doing it. I don't know. Er One Eric, when does, uh, when does the stock uh, start trading? Uh, what's the, the symbol going to be? Uh, it's going to trade on the TSX, on the Toronto Stock Exchange. The symbol will be ABXX. That's two X's because Barrick Gold is ABX. So it's not ABX, it's ABXX. Think of it as X-rated Barrick Gold. So, um, it'll be interesting. So <laughs> to, and, and this is going to be, I think it's going to be very interesting to see how it does because my first thought, and you'll hear this when you hear the, um, the interview with Robert Friedland, I was thinking that nothing really happens when the stock starts trading because, frankly, they're, all they're talking about is the thermostat. I mean, I, I just told you my vision of where this is headed. Um, I'm, you know, an ex-software architect turned futures trader. There's not a lot of people that have that combination of background to see what I see here. And I figured it would be a long time before anybody figured this out. Uh, when I talk to Robert Friedland, he says he thinks it's going to take off right away because other people will see it. I was betting on not. Now, what kind of surprised me is they just on Monday this week, on the 23rd, they approved the reverse merger. And the reverse merger is actually an interesting story. It's with uh, New Millennium Iron, which was a junior uh, mining company in Canada, kind of defunct. It was at risk of being delisted by the TSX for not enough activity. So the way a SPAC normally works is you basically buy a shell company that, that is already publicly listed and you just get the company with no assets. They ended up getting a huge uh, iron ore deposit in Quebec and Labrador for free. And they're kind of like, okay, well, we weren't counting on that, but we'll take it. So I, I, I'm not, I don't think that's really material to uh, the investment prospects. But they, they ended up uh, being acquired into this company. Now, New Millennium Iron, NML.to, has been up crazy in the last few days, probably on anticipation of this shareholder meeting that was today. So it seems like the stock is really active. And I don't know enough about this. I don't know if like merger ARB guys are just following all of the, the, the mergers and don't really know the fundamentals or if somebody's really hot on this. But one way or another, New Millennium Iron, which is the way you can buy the stock now that's going to get merged, eventually will become ABXX, is trading quite actively. So I'm not sure what to make of that. So Eric, in your mind, what's the trade here? Is, or is it a trade at all? Like, is this a more of like a long-term buy and hold investment for you? What, what's your thinking of how this plays out? For me, it's very much a long-term buy and hold. I think of this like buying Amazon in 1998. You know, there were all kinds of ups and downs. And if you bought it and hold it for 20 years, you did incredibly well. Um, I think that these guys are maybe going to really redefine how commodity futures and eventually other markets work. And I think it's just really exciting. Um, I didn't think that there was a short-term trade because I didn't think most people would get it. Now, as I look at the action in the reverse merger company, which is New Millennium Iron, um, it is pretty active. And I don't know if I don't know enough about these reverse mergers, if they're just always active because there's merger ARP guys that are all over them or, or how this works. But there's a lot of activity in the stock in the last um, few days. So I'm planning to buy more when it starts trading. Uh, December 15th is the target uh, trading date under the symbol ABXX. 
Um, frankly, I was hoping that what would happen is that it would move down a little bit initially because we figure there's going to be a bunch of angel investors. I was in the, the last capital raise round. The first round guys were Kyle Bass and, and uh, Robert Friedland and those guys got in. They've got a huge profit built up because they were in at a much lower uh, initial price. I was thinking that a lot of those guys, just as a matter of discipline, you know, they, they sell enough, what people call a free ride trade, where they sell enough to get back their original investment. So the rest of it is basically a no risk, just ride it and see where it goes kind of thing. I was hoping the original angels would be selling at least some of their positions as soon as it started trading, because I want to, I, I didn't get as big of a position as I would have liked to in the angel round. Um, I'm losing confidence in that view, though, as I see what's happening already in uh, NML, which is the uh, the company that's reverse merging into it. I should be. I want to make sure we're careful too. If anybody listening is not a professional trader, please be very careful. You don't want to just go buy NML uh, because it is going to turn into ABXX later. First of all, there's a one for twelve consolidation, so you're going to have to buy twelve shares of NML to get one share of ABXX. But more importantly, this is a tiny little thirty eight million. Uh, market cap, essentially defunct little company. So if you don't know how to trade illiquid issues using limit orders carefully, uh, don't chase the stock because you you know you could easily uh, chase the price up substantially just by throwing money at it. So if, if, if what I just said doesn't make sense to you and you're not familiar with that kind of trading, leave the NML stuff to the pros, wait until uh, ABXX is trading around December 15th. For pro traders who know about illiquid instruments, you know you can buy NML.to now. Um, it's it's very illiquid, but it seems to have picked up dramatically on the news of the uh, the shareholder meeting. So I'm not sure how to interpret that. So Eric, uh, when you do a reverse merger, there's going to be a certain amount that's held by the existing shareholders of NML, and then the rest will be held by the existing holders of ABEX. Why don't you walk us through what proration that'll be done and kind of give us a little sense of the financials from that perspective? Yeah, NML.to, which is New Millennium Iron Company or, or Iron Corporation, will become 18% of ABXX. And the other 82% of ABXX will be the uh, current ABEX shareholders, myself included. Uh, so presumably, uh, I'm hoping at least a few of those early angels are going to cash out or free ride on, on some of their stock, and there'll be some to buy. The, the thing that, that's frustrating to me is because Josh doesn't want to dilute his own shares. There is no capital raise, so you can't, you know, you can't throw lots of money at this and chase it. You could chase the the stock price pretty easily. It's a fairly small issue. Um, I, I'm trying to figure out, and I would welcome any ideas that you guys have as to how to trade this. I was originally thinking there was a good chance of a dip in the price after it starts trading as some of the early angels get liquidity and it's there, you know, it's the people call it an overhang. There's the, the guys that had restricted stock. Finally, they're allowed to sell it and they start selling it. The thing is, I know I, I'm in a way I'm one of those guys and I don't want to sell it. I want to buy more. There may be more of them that want to buy more. So I, I'm not sure uh, on such a, you know, with the, such a small public float, where this is going to go, but we'll see what happens, I guess, on uh, the 15th of December. Eric, that's a fascinating story. I, I really want to thank you for coming on our show and, and sharing it with our listeners. We're going to all be watching very closely in the next coming weeks and more than that in the next coming years as a lot of this technology and this groundbreaking kind of different way of thinking about how exchanges and how trading works. So I just want to say thank you very much for coming on our show. Well, thank you, Kevin. And I want to stress, too, I have no idea, you know, the, this merger acquisition, what happens to the acquiring company and the reverse merger target, you know, how, how do the tra shares trade between now and the day that ABXX starts trading? I frankly have no clue. What I can tell you is five years from now, I expect it to be a whole <laughs> lot more valuable than it is now. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks a lot, Eric. Okay, Patrick, it's that time. Talking charts. Time for your voodoo. Oh, magic. by the way, you didn't even bother to mention that we were going to talk charts at the beginning. But anyway. I know. I screwed up. For those uh, who don't know, I, I honestly, I stumbled on the opening, what, six times? Yeah. 
Yeah, Shame it was pretty. Uh, it was pretty ugly. It so was, it was so ugly. Yeah, anyway, so but let's talk some charts. Now. All right, listen, we, get, we are going to always start with these top three because it's a great thing to talk about charts. But very quickly, let's review what we talked about last week. Obviously, Bitcoin was the number one thing we talked about. Or number, it was number three. And really what was amazing was the reversal we had today, right? It's Thursday. We're taping this a day early. Yeah. And, and it uh, was the, uh, the turkey hangover it came a little yeah. early to the Bitcoin bulls. Yeah, it went from uh, it, at its peak yesterday. It was at nineteen five, and we traded as low as sixteen, almost at sixteen thousand. I mean, that's a pretty sharp drop from top to bottom in two days. That was uh, uh, a pretty significant seventeen uh, percent drop in two days. I don't want to so, be um, the kind that sits there and takes uh, a decline after something's risen like what one hundred percent in two months, and say, "Oh, it's down twenty. It's a big deal." But it's too but be we were talking, we were, but we're expecting that. Yeah, but I mean, listen, anything that parabolically rises at the rate it was, and, the, and at some point the ra rally was going to be checked, it's being checked. Yeah, and, and, to, to, and to your credit, you talked about that, the increasing slope of the lines. You drew all your lines, and, and, it's, and you it's were inevitable. Yeah. But, the, the, it, but one day doesn't make a new reversal of trends, so yeah. I don't want to already uh, say yeah. that that's done. So, so second, uh, number two on our list was obviously the U.S. dollar breakdown. Uh, and, uh, well, the U.S. dollar's been weak, it has continued to deteriorate, but I wouldn't already say that this was one for the bears, that they've already legitimately broke this down. But it's been very, very weak price action. I think it's something to keep watching into next week. Oh, um, I, I agree, Patrick. But the one thing I did find interesting was on, was it Monday that we had the big uh, ISM numbers? Yeah. And the dollar went bid and they crushed gold. And it really set the tone for the trading of that day. Now, yeah. subsequent to that, the dollar's gone back into its full-fledged kind of bear, you know, drip yeah. lower. So mode. you're talking about here. Let me just quickly thing. There was there actually. Let me put it on a four-hour here. It was uh, this can uh, this candle that you were talking right. about right here. And that that was that was Monday morning, and it set the tone. It it kind of induced this strange rotation in the market. You saw. Uh, what was it? NASDAQ go offered. You saw the banks go bid. Interestingly enough, it was also coincided with the monster rally in the EV. So there's yeah. all sorts of weird undercurrents. But having said that, it really did. It, re it looked like it was going to control how the market was going to trade for the rest of the week. But then just as quickly as it started, it kind of got stuffed out and headed back lower again. But uh, unfortunately, yeah. gold couldn't pick itself off the mat. And it just, yeah. uh, even though the dollar went down, it couldn't rally. Yeah. And so and the number one was the OPEX gamma roll off as to whether volatility was going to return. And well, I mean, we did have a pretty strong rip to the upside come uh, come the start of the week. But I don't know. That's it's a not call, it's man. not it's not really a crazy move. But no. it was. But I wonder how much the Thanksgiving uh, lower volume had to do with that and whether really the volatility is going to be here next week. It's just um, it just uh, there wasn't enough trading days to really get things going at the start of this week. Right. OK. Do you, let's what do go you on. think? We reviewed think... last week. Let's go on. Yeah, to let's what... go. OK. So, look, so number uh, number three. And this was uh, your thing of it's now now that Bitcoin has cracked. One of yeah, the because we, we got... actually designed number three before Bitcoin had really accelerated to the downside. Now, the real question is, if it cracks and continues to crack, will it lead to a gold rally? Is yeah. Eric Townsend correct that, that Bitcoin was uh, sucking the oxygen from the gold bugs? And uh, will this see them returning a little bit of uh, allowing gold to breathe and, and get a, a rally? Well, from I'll, you know, I, I think that there's merit. I'll think of it this way. All right. So like, let's say, um, you know, you're you're one of these guys that loaded up on Bitcoin, even like at 13, 14,000. Forget catching it at 10,000. Right. And you suddenly uh, capture a solid 20, 30 percent uh, rise in Bitcoin in a very short window of time. And now you ha you can go and buy gold at one hundred dollars an ounce cheaper and, and sell your Bitcoin, you know, 30 percent higher. Suddenly it's not a bad diversifier to kind of throw some of that money back at gold's way. Right. Well, we'll see. That's what we're watching for next week. Yeah. So number, number two. two, number two. Well, this EV uh, can uh, EV correct lower without taking down the market. And what's your call? Do you yes or no? I don't know. I, I I'm I'm tempted to say yes. I think that EV is on its its island on its own. It's just creating like a mania. which one do you want me to pull up? Neo or which one? 
Ah, oh, you can pull up anything. Neo, uh, uh, pull up CIIC. Like, uh, th- these are some, like, what's yeah. that? That's just insane. That's a flagship formation. <laughs> like, 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 honestly, look at that thing. A flagship formation. I don't know. What the fuck is a flagship formation? I don't formation? know, but it, that's You're just it making is. shit up. Uh, <laughs> and no, I would never do that. And uh, SBE, Sam Bob Edward. So SBE? Yep. Switchback Energy Equity. Like, they're just, yeah. these things are insane. Yeah. And and it seems like the crappier, the better the rallies. So. They, see, they seem to have uh, had a really strong, like, it's too early to already say top is in. They're obviously taking a one-day breather off of the highs, which is uh, not out of norm from after these things have ripped, you know, 100% in three days, right? Uh, but uh, but it'll be really interesting to see whether that a little bit of a dip spurs buyers to buy the dip and and uh, still punch higher or whether it tops out. But like hey, these smaller yeah. ones. Sorry, go ahead. I'm just saying these these smaller ones for sure are not going to drive a broader market correction. But what happens when uh, if we see the tops on the Teslas and the Neos and stuff like that? Like I mean, those are are larger cap plays that actually can influence sentiment a little bit more, right? So I'll, I'm going to say that I think that it, it wouldn't affect the real market. But I will say another thing: when you see the like the 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 shit rallying at the end like when the flow the like when you flush the toilet and the shit floats up to the top that's we're getting towards the end and that is <laughs> like to me that's that's what we're experiencing what, what i know that's a little pattern, rude what that's what 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 chart pattern <laughs> can we name after that little <laughs> nothing let's go on to number i shouldn't have said it number, Anyways, one. number one what do you got what are you watching well, the uh, well, we want to just ask about the commodity and commodity currency breakout. Now, what's interesting is is that it, it, you could look at commodities as a broad basket in a number of different ways. And like so, here I'm going to start off with just showing the chart of um, uh, the um, MSCI, sorry, the GSCI commodity index. And this index has clearly broken out already. Uh, and and is gone. But when you look at something like the the Bloomberg uh, commodity index here, we can see that uh, this is just beginning to look like a breakout. And that's largely because the Bloomberg commodity index is so heavily weighted to oil. And so when oil had this big turn on the uh, on the upside, it finally gave the uh, commodity index the kind of tailwind to make that breakout. And uh, and like this kind of a breakout in oil, I still think it measures out to like forty eight fifty bucks. I mean, there could still be in the in the coming week um, another ten percent rise still in crude oil here in the next little bit, and will that kind of follow through? But then what also is the benefactor of that is like the Aussie and Canadian dollar, right? So Aussie dollar edging towards its highs, the Canadian dollar con- consolidating along those highs. Are we going to get the breakout in commodities and the commodity-based currencies? Even the Brazilian real is uh, it, like, here, let me just pull this one up. Uh, it's, um, uh, you can see here, just basing off of the bottom and rolling up like some of these uh, kind of even some of the e, uh, emerging market kind of commodity based currencies may actually be s- setting up to go. So Patrick, I don't want to gooter it, but I definitely think that it is set up to go. I think we're going to get a breakout. We should watch for it. Uh, the Canadian dollar, the Australian dollar, great commodity currencies ways to play it to me that, uh, that uh, Bloomberg Commodity Index looks like it's about to take off. I actually like oil even. I think oil is trading well. It's trading at new t- highs. I know everyone that trades oil for a living is bearish, but there's nothing new there. And uh, I just think that we have to be careful because I suspect that we're going to find that we get more what I call lumber type action in these commodities. And mm-hmm. like just pull up that lumber and remember how it's up 250% out of nowhere it was kind of a stealth bull market that occurred with very few people paying attention to it and i think that this could happen in commodities all throughout the globe i mean lumber was a very thin market though right right uh, but it's, like, yeah, it's all like, they're all benefiting from the same underlying force right and it's just some of them will take longer to play out you are that. you are 
to commodities what coiners are to Bitcoin, right? <laughs> like you, you're like, yeah, you know, it's it, my forecast is like a thousand kajillion bajillion dollars higher. Like I, what I do know is is that things like energy stocks. Let's talk about this. Like I, let's use the XOP. Like I mean. These energy stocks simply did not participate in any of the re the bull phase, even just until a month ago, and when this whole thing turned actually on the vaccine news. I mean, it was a stone's throw from its March lows, and so the um, at least from an energy stock company uh, like these uh, equities, there I, in my mind. There, this could just be the first couple of innings of a nine-inning game. I see more uh, upside here than on the commodity itself. I think yeah. you, this, you want to almost play this. Just, I, I want to remind you and all everyone listening how bearish everyone was on energy a month ago. Oh, yeah. Oh. They were so sure that all these companies were going to go bankrupt. because Now uh, look at them. They're ripping. And I was so sure that it was going to be the first week of December that they bought them. So I blew it too. I did own some. I didn't, I'm just still waiting for some of them. So that would be just like but it to take off without me. What's interesting is a so many of the other commodity based stocks have actually also had a huge week. Like look at first. So let's go with the ag stocks like Nutrien. Look at the way it ripped last week in the last week uh, or Mosaic. Look at the way uh, these yeah. uh, ag stocks are just going. But even then, take um, some of those uh, um, kind of uh, resource stocks or the broader iron ore stocks so like Valet or, or Rio Tinto. Like these things are just on fire. I think we're going to look back and the vaccine the announcement will prove to have been the bottom in all these things. And, and it will also prove to be the end of the uh, kind of – tech over old economy stock yeah. trend that had been lasting for years. And even then, like, look at the way BHP Billiton broke out. Like, this is like more, even though it does iron ore, it's like a very diversified energy. But like, these things are, and, and like, it looks like it's going and double topping along its high. But man, if this thing breaks to a higher high, this thing could be an $80 stock. There's right? the kind of talking charts that I would expect. If it goes higher, you know, it go higher. Well, I mean, I'm just saying that those people that think it's just going to double top, I'm saying that these things can break out and just well, go. I, well, not only that, look at those. We're getting all sorts of runaway gaps, right? This, 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 this. Well, is... okay, stop over there. BHP oh. Billiton will always have gaps because it trades in Australia. So, like, oh, I mean, that's right. It's 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 a, an ADR, so you're going to get that uh, that gapping price action always, right? I never um, thought about it, that, Patrick. You're so smart. Oh, my God, whatever. Okay, right, so, so what do you got for anyways, us? What are we going to talk charts this week? Well, we just did. I think that's enough. Oh, that's buddy. enough? Yeah, I think we covered enough charts. Let's, let's get on with the rest of the show. Okay, sounds good. Okay, Patrick, this week in trading history, what do you have for us? All right, well, I want to go back to November 22nd in 1909 for the incorporation of the Wright Company. And so the Wright brothers, Orville and Wilbur, incorporated the Wright Company, funded with a million dollars in startup capital. Now, Orville Wright uh, would estimate that the company built about 120 airplanes during its first five years as, uh, of the company's operations. But it was uh, about uh, six years later in 1915 when Wright Company would merge with Glenn L. Martin Company, forming the Wright Martin Company. And so Wright Martin uh, was a short-lived air, uh, aircraft manufacturing bu uh, business venture. The company escalated the Wright Brothers patent wars with other aircraft manufacturers until this resolution, which would largely was because uh, of the start of the U.S. involvement in World War I, uh, where the government solved that patent war was by cross-licensing agreements developed and managed through the Manufacturers Aircraft Association. So Martin soon resigned and dissolved the Wright Martin Joint Enterprise within a year after that. The company was renamed Wright Aeronautical in 1919 and shifted from manufacturing aircraft to manufacturing aircraft engines, uh, developing the pivotal Wright Whirlwind engines, which changed aviation dramatically. Uh, so Wright Aeronautical merged with the Curtis Aeroplane and Motor Company in uh, July, on July 5th of 1929 to become the Curtis Wright Corporation, uh, an American global diversified product manufacturer and service provider uh, of all sorts of uh, commercial, industrial, defense, and energy markets uh, stuff for air, uh, airplanes. And by the end of World War II, it was the largest aircraft manufacturer in the United States, supplying whole aircraft in large numbers to the U.S. armed forces. 
But Curtis Wright, though, failed to make the transition to design and produce jet aircraft despite several attempts. And so Curtis's failure to research and develop more advanced uh, wing and airframe designs provided an opening for North American, Bell, Lockheed, and Northrop uh, and other U.S. aircraft manufacturers to submit newer and more advanced aircraft designs. With the rapid development of the jet engine technology and near supersonic flight, the technological lag resulted in Curtis's losing a number of critical post-war military aircraft orders. And the final nail in the coffin was when Northrop uh, uh, F-89 Scorpion uh, was chosen over the XF-87 Blackhawk. And so after the F-87 uh, orders were canceled on October 10, 1948, Curtis Wright shut down its entire aeroplane division and sold the assets to North American Aviation. And so that was uh, when... Uh, uh, the Wright Brothers uh, company sort of came to an end. But when we go back to Glenn Martin, who originally partnered with them at the beginning, uh, he, he went on to, uh, to manage his Glenn L. Martin company, which continued major aircraft manufacture throughout 1950s and 60s, began developing rockets, missiles, and spacecraft. In 1961, the company merged with American Marietta Corporation and become an industrial conglomerate. And then, which in 1995, merged with Lockheed to become today's Lockheed Martin. So Glenn Martin survived, but the Wright brothers' uh, uh, adventure, at least at the corporation, uh, um, ended uh, well over a half a decade ago, or sorry, half a century ago. And that's this week in history. I like it, Patrick. Thanks for sharing that with us. Let's move on to WTF. Yeah. Clip of the week. We're going to go pull an old one because it's Thursday and we're – Running a little behind schedule, so we're pulled one from what, a couple of years ago. What do you What do you have in store for us? So this was a mashup of Tropic Thunder, and as Lena says, you can mash up Tropic Thunder with almost anything and be awesome. And uh, <laughs> it was it was Tropic Thunder with uh, basically a little bit of Powell, a little bit of Trump, and uh, this is what we get. If I was Fed Chair, I'd be pausing uh, until, until we had clear a sequence of, of inflation numbers that were above 2% at the minimum. And not, you know, I, mean, I, I, I actually think 2% is too low a target, but that, that's an impossible. You try and make that argument of the Fed and they go crazy. That's the signal. Go, 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 go. Let's go freaking get here. The president now in an interview with The Washington Post has said, uh, I'm doing deals and I'm not being accommodated by the Fed. They're making a mistake because I have a gut and my gut tells me more sometime than anybody else's brain can ever tell me. <laughs> he doesn't look too good. Oh, don't drink that water. That water's like a Petri dish. No, don't. Uh, Albert, do you have any booty sweat? Uh, yeah, get him chugging on some of Alpha's ass water. That'll bring him around as a cure all. I'm not even a little bit happy with my selection of Jay Powell. Not even a little bit. Pump your brakes, kid. That man's a national treasure. I just want to throw another shrimp on you, Bobby. That shit ain't funny. Hey, fellas, it's hot. We're tired. It stinks. Are you fucking with you, Kangaroo Jack? I'm sorry, a dingo ate your baby. You know that's a true story? Lady lost a kid. You about to cross some fucking lines. Guys. Making those remarks in the Hamptons, according to Bloomberg, saying that uh, he had some suspicions that Jay Powell wasn't necessarily doing the right thing uh, in terms of interest rate hikes going forward. This is a, a criticism that the president has made before, including to Joe Kernan in an on-camera interview earlier this year. Here's what the president said back then. Kill him. This is the last who is this? This is Flaming Dragon. Okay, Flaming Dragon. Fuck face. First, take a big step back and literally fuck your own face! I put a very good man in the Fed. I don't necessarily agree with it because he's raising interest rates. I'm not saying that I agree with it, and I don't necessarily I agree do. with it. I yeah. must tell you, I don't. So whatever you're thinking, you better think again. Otherwise, I'm going to have to head down there, and I will rain down on a godly fucking firestorm upon you. You're going to have to call the fucking United Nations and get a fucking binding resolution to keep me from fucking destroying you. I am talking scorched earth, motherfucker. I will massacre you. 
I will fuck you up! <laughs> you know, Tom like you Cruise said, was can't... underrated in that movie. Yeah. He really was. It was, it was uh, that movie was uh, phenomenal. Yeah. You know, I, I enjoyed that one, making that one. I enjoyed reliving the idea that uh, the Fed was actually hiking rates, which is seems like such an eternity ago. They did that in the past? Yeah, they did that in the past. <laughs> Someday they'll do it again. Okay, there let's move on, Patrick. Okay, time for no stupid questions. Lena, welcome. Hello. There we go. That's what I'm looking for. <laughs> Okay, so the first question of the week is, I hear many people talk about how hedge funds have underperformed against indices. I read on Google, hedge funds aren't required to report their returns publicly. I tried looking up some notable hedge funds returns. My question is, how do people actually know hedge funds have underperformed against the market? That's a great question, and I'm going to take this one, Patrick. All right. So as this reader correctly noted, uh, noted hedge funds do not have to report their uh, returns uh, publicly. And in fact, they don't even report their returns daily on most basis. They usually just do it on a monthly basis. And so when you hear people say that hedge funds have underperformed, how are they telling that that's the case? Well, there are companies out there that uh, either create indices, indices or even are funds of funds. And so they will know all the returns. And that's the kind of the key is that there is an institutional community that, that will talk about this. And when one company returns, it'll go into the into this actual index or it'll be passed around. For example, uh, there's HSBC has something called the Hedge Fund Weekly. And in there, they actually report all of the recent announcements by the various hedge funds. So you can go there and I like have it right in front of me. I have something. When's this from? I think this is from last week, and yet a lot of these returns are from September and October. But they'll go through and they'll talk about the top investment funds, and it'll be like number one. This right now is Saba Capital Offshore, up eighty-one point six percent. Then there's Inflection Capital, and then L1, Ascendo, River Park, blah 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 blah. And then they'll actually have a list of the bottom ones, which is Alkin Capital, which is down fifty-eight uh, percent, to Tosca Pegasus down fifty-three, and so on and so on. The, the long and short of it is that there is a community that does know these things. So when you hear them say that this is the average return of hedge funds, it's not like they're just pulling that out of the sky. It's, a, it's either an amalgamation of a fund of funds or an index of some sort. It's just that it's not available for mortals like Patrick and I. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Not for mortals like us. All right, Lena, next one. So the second question is, Hey guys, you're my favorite Finn podcast. I learned that the only way to trade long-term was to have a sense of humor about the pain of greed. You guys are my moment of zen at the end of the week. My Aww. question is, you keep talking about commodities and how they are a great way to play the inflation trade. My tiny comedian brain, I'm a comedian in my real life, can't possibly learn how to trade futures just yet. So, what would be the ETFs to play to gain exposure to this sector as the dollar gets taken to pound town like the cheap pixelated pornographic <laughs> film that it is? So, oh, when, yeah, when, someone writes a, when someone writes a question like that, you know that it's going to get included into the huddle, right? Yeah. Taken to pound town like the cheap pixelated pornograph pornographic film that it is. Awesome. And I can't even pronounce it. So, Patrick, this one's up your alley. What do you got for us? Well, what one the one easiest way for a retail investor to do this is just to play the fact that money commodity uh, stocks are correlated to the commodities themselves. And so while uh, if you're an intermediate to more sophisticated trader, you can turn to the derivatives markets and play the futures markets and options on futures, you can do that. But there are ETFs and individual resource companies that are going to benefit from commodities rising. And I feel that generally the easiest thing to do for, for a retail investor like that is, is just to find a, some form of a, um, a, a good uh, ETF basket that, that holds a, a commodity stocks and trade that. That's like, you can do, you can do it in one basket. Like um, I'll give an example, like here's uh, the spider, 
uh, shares. Uh, this is the uh, GNR, which is uh, not Guns N' Roses, though, but G <laughs> that's the easiest way to remember it. Uh, but uh, it's the Global uh, Natural Resources ETF. Right. And this thing here is going to have a correlation uh, to uh, commodities, period. Right. It almost like, so looks exactly like the GSCI. Yeah. Right. And uh, and so, you know, I mean, here you're owning the resource stocks themselves, but it's easy to own and you don't have to do all that stuff of whether it's in contango, contango backwardation, whether you're rolling, what, whether you're buying a strip where you have to go, how to roll it. Like you could just uh, play the companies that will benefit from it. Right. And one of, the, you well, one of the things I will say is that if you go find an actual commodity ETF that holds the commodities, the problem about it is the commodities themselves are less volatile. So when you go and buy it through futures, you're using leverage typically. But when you're buying something, uh, you know, an index of a basket of commodities, you can't use that same leverage that you're using in the futures market. So often it's not enough, you know, bang for the buck. And so that's why it actually makes sense to buy the companies in a lot of cases because they are, in essence, giving you the leverage to that commodity. Right. So, and that's, uh, that's, and that's, that's the simple answer to it, right? Uh, I mean, look, if you want to take it to the next level, you can. But uh, so if you want to keep it simple, that's the best way. All right. It's time. Oh, actually, Lena, you have to come on and tell people where they can submit their questions because there's no stupid question. Just only stupid only what, Kev? Stupid only answer. stupid answers. <laughs> And we do read all the questions that are being submitted, and we do appreciate all the questions. We just that sometimes we just don't know how to answer them. Or um, <laughs> I, I like Alina's getting in the digs. <laughs> it's true. Or but or we do appreciate. We do, no, it's just a huge volume of questions coming in. We can't possibly air them all. How about that one? That's better, right? Yeah, we'll stick with that one. <laughs> But anyway, <laughs> submit your questions to no stupid questions at markethuddle.com. All right. So let's let's talk. Skin of the game, Kev. Uh, Patrick, two in a row. What do you mean? It's three in a row, because Cuppy's pick for me was uh, uh, that one as well. doesn't count. Yeah. Can't yes, count. it does. Okay, well, I get I get the beer you out get of the that beer. Dude. I'm not gonna not do that, but you can't count that one. That one's uh, so you're two in a row. Well done. So, Pat, Pat, oh, sorry. Oh, let, let's let's talk about the rules first. Yeah. Okay. Skin in the game is the weekly opportunity for us to demonstrate that we are degenerate gamblers at heart. Every week, one of us presents a wager, and the other guy chooses which side of the bet he wants. Every wager needs to be settled by the next episode, and the currency for the wagers is as follows: a Duke and Duke, pint of beer, a burger, bet, a pitcher, case of beer, two four. A uh, bottle of wine and a steak dinner. The winner of the bet is obligated to create a new bet for the following week and all wagers settle on full and there'll be no netting of positions. So last week, Patrick saw a weakness, saw a little chink in my armor, knew that I yeah, was, since you published a newsletter yeah, on it. since I was leaning against Tesla and he exploited it. Well done. And I was <laughs> so dramatically wrong. It's not even funny. It's just oh yeah! Like I just got oh, no. like, like okay. So I let, joked about it in the a following newsletter, by the way, that like the yeah. the truck ran me over, and Elon Musk so, and his truck ran me over. Then he put it into reverse, and he saw me squirming away, trying to pull my you know like my broken body off to the side, and he ran me over again. Yeah, yeah. Don't mess with him. Yeah, he's not the guy you want to piss off. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> so anyway, so so. Uh, yeah, you didn't. It didn't even Wasn't even approach. It didn't even. It didn't what even. Was it four sixty five? Like it was straight up. It was four sixty straight. Uh, one touch, and it just kept going straight up. Yeah. And more importantly, you didn't. You did. You didn't have a five full trading session. You. you uh, yeah, you, you did you pick that. Anyways, well done, Patrick. You you deserve every bit of the kudos for that. As I <sighs> said, you exploited a right. weakness. So now that's two of my emotional kind of. Uh, Let's just say, uh, you know, underbellies oh, I'm, that I like. I, I'm, I'm going I'm to try to get you emotional again. Okay, let's see what let's you got. Let's see if I can succeed. And so, so uh, I want to talk the Japanese yen. Okay. All right. Now, uh, what's ha what, what, what the issue, of course, is, is, is that uh, everyone has such a bias about the dollar. So I want to remove the dollar from the equation, and we're going to the euro-yen cross. Oh, I like it. It's getting fancy. 
No, well, you know what? Like, listen, everyone has an opinion on a dollar. Let's not talk dollar. This yeah. is now we're talking about uh, two currency, uh, two of the largest currencies outside of the U.S. dollar. Okay. And um, and what we have had in the early part of the year was an, in- an incredibly strong euro rally relative to the yen. I mean, we went uh, obviously from the 114 to toward 127, and it's been pretty quiet. And I, I know that uh, you get a little bit of lead in your pencil when thinking about the yen. And, uh, and so, well, you know what? I want to test how, what your resolve on this is. And I'm going to make this as simple for you as possible. Ready? Okay. Yeah, I'm ready. You're just going to say up or down. Well, I mean, if I say simple, you know that. That's what I'm going to say. Okay. So Take here it. we are, up or down from here. Right now, the, the it's one twenty four eighteen, above or below next Friday. Above. Okay. All right. So let's begin the betting. Uh, so you you so you're you're saying the euro will strengthen. I'm saying euro yen over. will close. Uh, we're saying at the close at four o'clock on Friday, right? Next Friday, yeah, like at four the o'clock close, close yeah. the euro will be stronger than the yen from where it was today yeah. at one twenty four. Yeah, I'm, I'm, okay. A, I'm okay. I'm up. I'll go straight to a pint of beer. You know what? I, I, I'm okay staying at a pint of beer. Okay, you're done. Hopefully, I, I end my streak. Yeah, it's. Uh, you know what? Uh, this. I, I would have I actually thought I thought the euro was going to strengthen. I I'm, I'm when when the Twitter f- uh, thing goes out, I'm going to vote for you. But <laughs> <laughs> that's great. I like that. Okay. But but so so you know we'll we'll see. But maybe because I say that, I'm actually yeah. gutturing it for you. We'll, we'll find doing out. The double the double bluff or whatever. Okay. Thanks yeah, for yeah. tuning into the Market Huddle. We appreciate you spending time with us. Please give us a follow at the Market Huddle on Twitter. Lena's out there and she gets sick and tired of Patrick and I being the only ones to talk to and loves talking to you guys. So give her a shout. You can listen to the market huddle on all the networks, Google podcast, Podbean, Spotify, Android play, iTunes, and YouTube. A lot of people watch on YouTube to see all of our charts and visuals. And while you're there, please like, and subscribe to get our latest content. And you know what? Please review us on iTunes. You know, the drill, Patrick, where can they find you? You can find me at Patrick Ceresna on Twitter, as well follow me at BigPictureTrading.com. Kev, where can they follow you? So I'm at Kevin Muir on Twitter, and then you can go to my newsletter at the macro, or sorry, the macrotourist.com. So listen, we can never have too many friends, bull market, bear market. We're just happy to spend some time together on this crazy rise. So thanks for tuning in. Now stick around for the after show. So we have to talk about uh, the topic uh, that's most on my mind, and it was brought up by Andreas, and it's ketchup. <laughs> and so <laughs> Lena and I were having a look after the con- after our uh, our interview, and do you know that Canada is the ketchup capital of the world? What? Yep. <laughs> okay. What oh the wait, hell? wait. I'm sorry. We eat more ketchup per capita than the U.S. neighbors. But no, there's somebody that's beaten us. Who's that? I'm going to give you guys a, a chance to decide who might eat more ketchup than us. Oh, my God. It's, it's, it's not going to be anyone in Europe. It is. It is. No, really? Yep. It is? Is it England? Well, that would be a good guess. That would UK? be a good guess. No. Ireland? It, but it's something, you know what, when you think of Canada, it's cold. Maybe that something to Iceland? do with, with the cold. No, it's not Iceland. Iceland's not actually that cold. Okay. Because it's in the middle of the ocean. And I, I get. Well, and- Andreas brought it up. So is it no, Denmark? No, it's close. It's Finland. I'll stop uh, making us do it. Finland he seems to eat more ketchup than us. Get, oh, okay, here we go. Guess uh, uh, they did a survey. Guess how many? What percent of Canadians currently have a bottle of ketchup in the fridge? Like a hundred percent. I know. That's what I would have thought. <laughs> like I'm actually shocked. <laughs> who, who who doesn't have ketchup? I, I think that the the, the the ones that didn't were just out of it that day. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I never used to buy ketchup. Yeah, though. but I, I I didn't have. I know because in my you, like you weren't you were weren't born here. We had to we had to instill and beat that into you. Eighty seven percent of Canadians have have a bottle of ketchup in the refrigerator. Anyway, and the other ones are in an old age home. That's uh, right. Elderly. They have or no something. fridge. That's, the other ones have no fridge. <laughs> 
<laughs> wow. Anyways, yeah, we. But we gotta talk about. Oh the yeah, bear. sorry. Um. Well, like, I went first last time, so why don't you guys go first this time? I'm going first. This is better than last week's beer. Uh, I'm uh, I'm gonna give this an 8.9. Wow. I like it. I'm, I'm an IPA guy though, so like, and this is a nice fruit. double you like, IPA. You like the fruit in the IPA. But you know what? I also uh, I also go for the the smoothness. Like, it, it, I mean, there's, of course, you're always going to get a little bit of hoppiness to it. But it, it, I I could just drink these all night. I love it. Okay. Love it. Love it. Love it. Don't say it. Let's see if you can make it without <laughs> saying it. Okay, Lena, what are you? Uh, you know how tempting it is I for know, me to say. I know. I know you have trouble. I wouldn't say this was one of my favorites, but it wasn't bad. I just prefer other beers so i would probably give this it wasn't a bad beer i just prefer other beers so i would give it like a seven so i don't mind it it's a fine beer in terms of taste but i'm not gonna i I was accused on twitter of falling for this uh, thing about the boomers too much and given that it's right (laughs) on there that this is for boomers it's not my beer it's not for me maybe it's for patrick it's not for me (laughs) seven five might have been higher had they not put Uh, boomers on it that's still nice yeah. yeah, it's the life. It's it's a good beer. It's just I I think I prefer other beers. I loved it. You guys are fools. Cause you're a boomer. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> By you guys not drinking this beer, it just means there's I, more of it for me. I, I, there's I just more it. of it for me, yeah. and that's fine. Well, you have to go to Sweden to get it, so you're gonna be in trouble. Yeah, no, yeah. I, and I've now have a reason to go. Okay, so <laughs> I have a show for everyone. Did I talk about this right. about last week, Lena? The Undoing. The Undoing. I don't remember. I don't think did I did. Tell me about so the un- I feel like you talked about Queen's oh, Gambit. Oh, yeah, that's right. So the und- was it good? I, I, I was thinking about watching Queen's the Gambit. The Queen's Gambit ended up being Netflix's most watched uh, original really? content ever. It's pretty good. Ever. Yeah, ever. Ever. It's pretty good. So. You know what? The trouble about it is that if you get too excited about it, then you might be disappointed. So I'll, I'll just say huh? it's it's a really solid show. and uh, I'm going to watch it when the hype is over. I think that's what I'm going to want. You just don't want to add to the Netflix already having great ratings for it. Yeah. Screw exactly. them. <laughs> I finished Netflix a while ago. I'm just waiting for more new content <laughs> to build up so I can start so binge watching you got to go it. do this undoing and tell me if you like it. I love it. It's got uh, Nicole Kidman and uh, Hugh Grant. Oh, yes. You did talk about this. Sorry. Oh, I, did I talk I, about this last week? I remember you talking about Hugh Grant. Yeah. Or did we talk I about this off air? I blocked it out. I can't remember. No, but anyways, I love I it. It's remember. great. I'm enjoying it. I actually thought that it was all, I didn't realize that I was watching them kind of getting caught up and it runs every week and now I'm caught up and I'm really pissed. <laughs> you know, when you get like, uh, literally my yeah. wife and I went to watch it last night and we we're like, oh God, we're caught up. And I was like, that sucks. Like, they, they got to stop this. <laughs> What's going to happen next? Yeah, this weekly thing. Although in <laughs> some ways, I actually think that releasing it every week now, like old school, is, uh, is, is smart. I think it's better for our mental health. I agree. Because I find you just binge watch it. I would have watched it all like in one night. I wouldn't have slept. <laughs> I would have traded like shit the next day. And you're much you better off I've if you just wait. Netflix. Yeah. You know uh, what show uh, my, my kids uh, were watching the uh, South Park pandemic special. Oh, I got to watch that. That sounds good. Uh, and, oh, uh, I watched it. I watched that. Yeah, one. so like I, I don't ever w- really watch TV that often, but I, I, I sat down and watched it with them, and that was good. Was I mean, Randy, it's pretty. Was Randy but, but, responsible for the COVID nineteen? Yeah, of course he was. Okay. Of course he was. <laughs> <laughs> of course he was. But, but uh, it was. Uh, you know, South Park is so over the top. But uh, you know what? I appreciate the fact that they're willing to go there. <laughs> <laughs> well, somebody has to, right? <laughs> I like it. I like it. Trump with the uh, with the flamethrower. That's all I have to say. It's. I'm running out of things to watch, so I might have to wait until all the episodes of uh, all the shows that Kevin just mentioned. So I don't know how long that's going to take. I've been watching like older shows. Um, I've been watching this show called Fear Thy Neighbor. What is that? I can't remember what network it's on. I I have it on Crave, and it's basically about... I like true crime stories, right? So it's basically about neighbor disputes that unravel into, like, murder. (laughs) God, It's crazy. It's crazy what kind of stories these people have. And these are, like, there's the real people that are being interviewed about these situations. It's like, fuck you, you, Bob. Your hedge is too big. Well, <laughs> literally something super, um, like something what? really small, and then it just it? spirals out of control. 
Was it was it McAfee that poisoned his neighbor's yeah, he dogs? Killed. No, he <gasps> no, he did worse than poison his neighbor's dog. He killed he his killed neighbor. Him. Oh, sorry, allegedly. It, not his name. Allegedly. His neighbor or his dog? No, the person. Like no, like his. Uh, he mur he well, so he was charged with murder. Um, he's a person of interest. <laughs> So then you're accusing him on the air. Not, Wait, I said but allegedly. is this the guy that said he was going to eat his own dick? Yes, that that's him. Guy? Yeah. <laughs> that's not allegedly. We can we can definitely say that. Yeah, there's a clip, I'm sure, yeah. out there. I'm no, pretty I'm pretty sure he killed I'm pretty sure he killed him. his neighbor. Or, sorry, allegedly killed his neighbor. <laughs> Why? What? Um, they didn't get along. I don't know. I'm just looking it up on the old Wikipedia, the Book of Knowledge. And... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so where is he here? Poor dog. Oh, my God. Dog. Neighbor. <laughs> yeah. Wait. He what? killed his neighbor. I thought it was only poison the neighbor's dogs, but yeah. Kevin's saying oh, he, he killed, killed his, his neighbor died? Yeah. yeah. Like, oh. Now he's, he can make it on the show. Who is? Yeah. He, on May 12th, 2017, McAfee was interviewed on ABC's 2020 regarding the alleged... Important word there. Murder of his neighbor, Greg Fall. Uh, Mc McAfee's wife was also interviewed in the segment. Interesting. Now I want to go watch that interview. Yeah. He's he's a guy I would not want to piss off. I won't lie. Like, I wouldn't want him. Oh, for sure. You don't I hope he doesn't listen to this. <laughs> you don't want to piss off a guy that's willing to eat his own dick. Okay? Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's just a way that's, that's a man with conviction. When he decides he's going to do something... He doesn't fuck around. <laughs> I'm gonna eat my dick. <laughs> so you know what's funny about him? He uh, he wasn't arrested, uh, but he, it's like this OJ thing where he got uh, convicted in civil court. Okay. So he owes 25 million in damages for killing his ex neighbor. Allegedly. Yeah, I guess I have to. Well, no, I'm allowed How to say I'm allowed to say that that. Who knows what I'm allowed to say. But anyways, um, yeah, so he's, uh, but it's okay. He's got a lot of That Bitcoin. sucks, being out $25 million and having to eat your dick all at once. I know. Like it, that's, like Listen, a, that's like a double At the blow. rate this is going, he might not have to eat his dick, though. <laughs> yeah, Bitcoin might. Like, no, because it was, it was, he made that call two years ago, and he said by two, uh, end of 2020, it was going to be. Yeah, like but we're not million. there. Let's, yeah, but like we're a month away. Listen, I think it, it like was it's crazy. The dick. Uh, oh, sorry. Here we go. The dickening countdown to John McAfee's dick eating. There's actually a site. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> oh, they got a site. It's dickening.com. <laughs> dickening. Okay, I gotta look <laughs> this up. There's 35 days, three hours, and 45 minutes and eight seconds. When is the 2020 dickening? Oh my god. He's got to do it on national television too. Well, that's what he said, right? Oh, this is hilarious. 35, the countdown. It. I'm going to I'm gonna keep this on my screen. I'm going to create a little window for the, for the countdown. It, it's like, who who cares about New Year's Eve? Yeah. <laughs> it's about the dickening. <laughs> There's also the dickening. They, they've, uh, the dickening after the happening, an event which minor rewards are cut in half. I wonder if they have to, maybe he only has to cut, eat half his dick. <laughs> okay. But, but you know what? Uh, they have the dickening parties. They're showing those gingerbread men there. Yeah. That's hilarious. This guy is like whoever wrote this site is he's a, he or she is a very devoted geek. They uh, they have a countdown to how many how much the Bitcoin has to grow on average each day before the dickening. So twenty eight thousand one oh one per day for the dickening. Wow. That's it. eh? Yeah. Wow. This is the. Oh, there you go. I see that, the gingerbreads. Yeah, that is awesome. <laughs> that's that's like uh, that. That basically means like Bitcoin has to pretty much double. It has to go like uh, German style hyperinflation of like doubling every single yeah, day. But listen, from here, it's not like it's, they still got a whole month. Never underestimate yeah. the ability of Bitcoiners. What to, I'd like to, to see is to some. Uh, Fintwit stars really start to get out there and start putting it on the line like John McAfee does. It's that guy, right. he's much like you think about it. He's he's putting it all on the line. Yeah. Yeah. National yeah. TV. I don't know who's going to show that. It's going to be Fox, don't you think? 
<laughs> <laughs> the ratings are plummeting. He needs some. They need something. They need something. I think you could start. Wow. Maybe you could start your own network, and it could be the first event. <laughs> premiere of the dickening. <laughs> that's right. The dickening. <laughs> I don't even well, know if we should the... talk about anything else. It's just that's a great way to yeah, end Yeah, we're it. ending the show on a yeah, high Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Have a great week, everyone. See you next yeah, week. Take happy care. Happy Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving uh, to right. all our Americans. That's right. It's actually, they're going to get it afterwards, but happy Black Friday. Don't kill anyone at the store. <laughs> all right. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>